we're live. Thank you and good afternoon. We'll start this, please start the recordings. PC recording done. Recording to the cloud all set and good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation jointly with the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts and the Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Uh, thank you, Sergeant. Can I be heard? Am I coming through okay? Yep, all good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Gennaro, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Today we'll be holding an oversight hearing on green infrastructure, urban flooding, and combined sewer overflows. We also will hear seven bills that will um, that will um, that we will really consider. Um, uh, uh, it is a pleasure to be joined by uh, uh, Chair Brannon and uh, Chair Ku. Uh, also, always a pleasure to be joined by the public advocate and all the members of the um, respective committees and all council members that may be joining this hearing. Uh, at the end of my statement, I will uh, recognize the members of my committee that are here. I'll let the uh, uh, subsequent chairs do that for their committees. Uh, okay, um, New York City faces a host of uh, a um, New York City faces a host of challenges to public safety and infrastructure uh, directly related to the climate crisis. The National Oceanographic, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has found that the rates of sea level rise along the eastern Gulf Coast of the U.S. are among the fastest. Uh, seen anywhere in the world, Union of Concerned Scientists estimates that by 2045, 42,000 New Yorkers living in 15,500 homes valued at approximately $8.5 billion will be at increased risk for chronic flooding. In the future, global warming is, um, is thought to intensify storms such that events that might once might have occurred once in 20 years may occur only as frequently as every few years. The most recent IPCC report, that's the International Panel on Climate Change report, found that the world is already two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than in 1850 to 1900 and is still warming at an unprecedented rate. Human influences on the climate are, quote, making extreme weather and climate events like heat waves, heavy rain and droughts more frequent and severe, putting more people, property and natural resources in harm's way, close quote. IPCC report concluded that until global net zero emissions of greenhouse gases is reached, it will be impossible to limit warming to any temperature threshold. Uh, in the interim, severe weather events will only continue to um, increase in frequency. This just means we have to get busy with what we have to do to protect the city. Since, uh, since Superstorm Sandy of 2012, the city has, uh, has numerous has learned numerous difficult lessons in the many ways that severe weather can threaten the infrastructure that all New Yorkers rely on. They've also been shown the limitations of overly targeted approaches to resiliency intervention. Ida brought widespread flooding in the vast swaths of the city. However, areas such as the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn uh, and um, Hamilton Beach in Queens that generally have a lot of flooding from coastal events did not flood. Um, instead, flooding caused by intense rainfall occurred throughout the city, while concrete services that limit the natural infiltration of water into the ground made a bad situation worse. Sea barriers and coastal defenses built to protect against coastal storm surges will not protect against rain, uh, the flooding caused by heavy rainfall events. It is vital that our approach to resilience to infrastructure acknowledge that the city is a complex system better served by a comprehensive plan than by piecemeal interventions. Uh, that said, I am... Um, um, I am one of those that thinks that um, you know storm surge barriers should get more of a uh, you know more of a thorough look than they've gotten. But I certainly agree with the approach of a comprehensive plan. I thank uh, my colleague Justin Brenner for passing his recent bill, uh, you know, for um, you know for the uh, production of such um, you know, comprehensive resiliency planning that we passed last 
uh, stated meeting. Uh, New York has more than 6,500 miles of sewage infrastructure and chronic issues with poor maintenance and upkeep of catch basins across the city. Um, while the New York City DEP has increased its proactive maintenance of catch basins, basins and sewage infrastructure, it operates a system pursuant to a state DEC uh, uh, speedies permit, which mandates that the system be properly operated and maintained in accordance with the terms of the permit. If the system is not properly maintained, maintain, people are exposed to sewage backups in basements, streets, and yards. At the average age of the sewer infrastructure in the city is 91 years old, and many parts of the sewage infrastructure are not fully built out or, or, um, or even fully funded. We made a case of this in the last hearing where there are parts of Southeast Queens that don't have um, any uh, you know, storm sewer um, capacity at all. I know that in this recent budget, we worked a lot with the EP to make sure that we move that forward. Um, but you know, we're having this hearing at a time when not all of the city even has uh, storm flooding. And that is, that is a sad statement. Um, according to the EPA, uh, the system, meaning the uh, sewer system was not properly maintained, finding the uh, EPA did, finding that New York City had an, had an excessive number of sewage backups between 2011 and 2015, more than 17,000, with numerous instances of repeat backups in the same locations uh, due to capacity issues, in addition to backups related to inadequate maintenance. That is, um, you know, that is what the EPA said. Um, as a result, the EPA issued an administrative compliance order pursuant to the Clean Water Act, uh, making the allegation that DEP violated the Clean Water Act by having failed to comply with the operation and maintenance terms and condition of the 14 permits that uh, it held. I'm just sure that they will give us an update on where they are on that front with compliance to the EPA uh, order. Um, uh, not surprisingly, it is, uh, it is often communities of color that all too often bear the brunt of this neglect. According to Eddie Bautista, Executive Director, of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, the city's largest combined sewer overflow outlets are located in communities of color. During Tropical Storm Ida, um, 11 of the 13 lives lost in New York City were residents of basement apartments who drowned <clears throat> when, when their homes flooded. These apartments are often the most uh, are often the most accessible options for new immigrants and low-income New Yorkers due to their lower costs and less stringent tenant vetting procedures. But when they are in the neighborhoods with inadequate or improperly maintained sewage infrastructure, the consequences, as we've seen, can be tragic. These recent events are a stark reminder that such disasters are not, quote, natural. Um, according to one of our, adv one of our advocates, uh, they are a function of a system that fails to protect everyone equally. Uh, you know, that is the assertion. We will talk more about that today. Today, we are hearing legislation. Uh, so that's kind of like the oversight topic. Now we're going to talk about the bills a little bit. Today we're hearing legislation uh, intended to expand on the work uh, the city has done to make sure the city is more resilient, uh, able to better monitor our infrastructure and improve our city response to the coming climate changes. I would like to thank the terrific committee staff who have done such great work over the years. Uh, Council to the committee, Samara Swanson. She goes back many years. Um, with me when I was chair previously, policy analyst Nadia Johnson, Ricky Chawla, and financial analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and finally my legislative director and counsel, uh, Nabi Cow, for all of their hard work. Um, I did, now, in terms of recognizing members of my committee, uh, I know I saw um, the council member Dharma Diaz. Am I still coming through okay? My, it says I'm not allowed to, to unmute myself. I'm still, I'm still coming through, Sergeant. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can still hear. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I saw um, Council Member uh, Dharma Diaz. I see Council Member um, and I, I, and uh, let me just, you know, make reference to the other mem members of the committee. I can't see if, if they're here or not, but Council Member Eleven and uh, Council Member Ulrich, um, and. Um, um, so um, I'm going to recognize the next chair, but just way the it, just in the way that you know hearing is going to go um, overall. Um, uh, you know the chairs will have the ability to you know, pose their questions on the oversight uh, uh, 
topic, uh, those that are, are the um, uh, authors of the bills that are on today will be given some you know, latitude uh, to ask questions longer uh, than the five minutes that is normally a lot of people who ask questions. I think that that's only uh, uh, fair. And also I'm gonna try to do what I can to get the public advocate in you know, pretty early to ask questions on uh, his bill that he has on the docket here um, out of respect for uh, his valuable time. If uh, you know, we can do that, I hope we can do that without any objections. And uh, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, you know, Chair Brannon to make his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. Uh, appreciate that. I will get moving on this. I know we have a very busy agenda today. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Justin Brandon. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I join Chair Gennaro and Chair Ku in welcoming you to today's joint hearing, and I also want to extend my thanks to them uh, for holding this hearing today. Uh, flooding is not a new phenomenon. It affects all New Yorkers, not just those who live near the water. When a tropical storm Elsa hit the city in July, more than five inches of rain fell in just a few hours, Areas of Upper Manhattan and the West Bronx experienced significant flooding. It wasn't because of storm surge. It was because heavy rains overwhelmed the city's sewers and drainage systems. The water had nowhere to go, and this problem will continue to get worse. According to the city's May 2021 storm water resiliency plan, the city is expected to experience 25% more rainfall by the end of this century. The city has aptly been nicknamed the concrete jungle. More than 70% of the city is made up of hard surfaces like concrete and asphalt, surfaces that prevent water from natural infiltration into the ground. With extreme weather events becoming more frequent and severe because of climate change, we need to act faster to make our concrete jungle green again. Green infrastructure, which includes rain gardens, bioswales, green roofs, permeable pavement, urban tree canopies, and green streets, are proven techniques that help absorb and filter runoff, floodwaters, and heavy rain. The city released a green infrastructure plan in 2010. Since then, more than 11,000 curbside rain gardens and over 70 blue belts have been constructed. The city even partnered with Copenhagen, Denmark to learn how the Danish deal with flooding from cloud bursts. We need to continue to be creative in designing green spaces and creating sponge areas like turning playgrounds and parking lots into huge sponges that can absorb, filter, and hold water so that surrounding areas do not flood. We look forward to hearing from the administration today about which projects have been implemented, what is planned, and what more can be done to manage stormwater. Today, we'll hear several pieces of legislation. Intro 67, sponsored by me, would make the city liable to homeowners for claims filed against the city if capacity related sewer backups cause water damage or loss to their homes. It would also require the city to develop a sewer backup mitigation plan, which is long, long overdue. A, cre a pre considered intro sponsored by uh, me and Chair Gennaro would help people install backwater valves, which prevent water or waste from backing up during rain events and flooding homes or businesses. This bill would require DEP to establish a program that provides financial assistance to reduce the cost of purchasing and installing backwater valves. Such a program would make it easier for people to purchase and install these devices to protect their homes. After the severe flooding from tropical storms Henri and Ida, such devices should be readily accessible and affordable for property owners. We'll also hear my bill intro 2168, which would require the DEP to create a water meter database. Anyone who registers and pays a periodic subscription fee would be able to access information about water meters. Such a database would provide much needed transparency and openness. As I've said countless times, the climate crisis is here. Parts of the city regularly flood after rainstorms. We wade through ponds in our streets and sidewalks because there is too much concrete and hard surfaces and not enough greenscaping and green infrastructure. Unless we ensure that plants, green spaces, and pervious surfaces are just as prevalent as hardscape surfaces, the rain will continue to turn streets into rivers and flood subways, homes, and businesses. I look forward to hearing from the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency 
DEP and the Parks Department during today's hearing. Before we uh, move further, I wanna thank my committee staff, of course, the amazing committee counsel, Jessica Steinberg-Albin, senior policy analyst, Patrick Mulvihill, senior finance analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, my chief of staff, Chris McCright, my senior advisor, Jonathan Yedin, and of course, my legislative director, Michael Sheldon, as well as all the staff from the Environmental Protection and Parks Committees for all their hard work in getting this important hearing together. With that, I'll turn it back over to Chair Gennaro. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, you know, thank you, Chair Brannon. I, 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 I uh, propose you have on today and the one that we did together uh, on the pack flow devices. Uh, and I would like to uh, bring on Council Member Koo for his opening statement. Council Member Koo, or, or Chair Koo. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to thank my fellow co-chairs, Council Member Gennaro and Brandon, for agreeing to hold this joint hearing. The climate crisis is here, and its effects threaten the well-being of all New Yorkers. One of the more immediate effects, which has been particularly damaging in the city this year, is flooding. These flooding events, including the Hurricane Ida uh, remnants, were rain events that lay bare the inadequacy of city's infrastructure to handle massive rain events. Areas of the city that had never seen significant flooding before were suddenly underwater leading to the loss of life and property. My fellow co-chairs have already discussed the details regarding how impactful excessive flooding will be for our city. But the severity of this threat cannot be overstated. We are clearly not prepared for what the future will bring us when it comes to flooding events. This is personal to me as I witnessed the struggle <clears throat> of so many in my district who had lost their lives and others, their lives turned upside down by our neighborhood nest nestled in Kisina Park in my district were so severely flooded that three people sadly lost their lives and 85 and 85 home experiences like this to become the new normal. Despite these tragedy, tragedies, there is still time to prepare and adapt our infrastructure to better handle what will continue to come our way in the future. Expanding green infrastructure the way we can go about doing this as upgrade our infrastructure in a way that also improves the city's environment uh, overall. My as past committee chair is how the city use of green infrastructure throughout the city. The city's parks, playgrounds, and other green space can all be adapted to expand their storm water capturing features, such as through the use of expanding the green streets program, building more rain gardens, especially in areas that are staffed for green space, bordering, bordering of, the, uh, of the reach of park features to their surrounding neighborhoods through the Parks Without Borders initiative, building more playgrounds with green features, converting unused or, unban or ab abandoned land into green space, and of course, maintaining and expanding the city's tree stock. As was previously mentioned, 
mention, we will also consider numerous pieces of legislation at today's hearing. But I would also like to call attention to a bill I sponsor. Sure, a bill I sponsor, intro 1618, will help us to better understand the harmful nature of combined sewer overflows and storm water remnants. Specifically, this bill will require DGP every year to study and report on the presence of contaminants from CSOs in the city's waterways, as well as DGP's progress toward milestones noted in the sewer overflow long-term control plan. It will also require DGP to develop an integrated watershed management plan for each waterway that is the subject of CSO long -term control plan and will require the commissioner to convene receive an update on the findings and analysis, as well as to provide additional advice. Intro 1618 will also require DEP to publish a report identifying opportunities to develop green infrastructure on the public and private lands and structures within the sewer checks that drain to each respective waterway. The report will also evaluate the effectiveness of DEP's regulations for reducing the volume of and establish a method to be used by the department to track CSOs and stormwater pollution reductions achieved from any new implemented standards. Lastly, the D the DEP commissioner sent the report and allow a public comment period before finalizing any plans or recommendations. I think this bill will establish a sound way for the city to better understand and limit the negative consequences of CSOs for the long term. And I look forward to discussing it and all other bills today. Thank you to all who have joined today to participate in this hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also joined uh, in our committee by members, uh, uh, Council Member Brandon, Whitey, Diaz, Dinowish, Council Member Holden, Brooks Powers, and Borelli. And also we have uh, uh, Council Member Levine, and Council Member Cabrera and Boyer. And all Council Member, some of our members may be crossed over to other committees. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Ku. I want to make sure I'm still coming in okay, Sergeant. You, you got me okay? <clears throat> yep, we still got you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Chair Ku. Before I uh, 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 you know, bring on the administration. I just want to make sure that um, everyone has been recognized. I, 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 I'm not sure if um, uh, Chair Ku got everybody, but as I go around, I see uh, Councilmember uh, Riley. Uh, I hope these are, are not uh, duplicative. I see Councilmember Brooks Powers, uh, Councilmember Cabrera, um, Councilmember Dinowitz, maybe it was already called. Um, Councilmember Rose, um, Councilmember Salamanca, Councilmember Van Bramer. I think that's everyone. Is there, is there any council member on that has not been recognized? I think that, uh, and I see Councilmember Darmi Diaz. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's everybody. And I think what I want to do in terms of process, it's always very complicated when there's so many chairs and so many bills on seven bills and a big oversight topic. And a lot of members that want to, they want to ask questions on either a bill or, or the oversight topic. And as this thing is rolling out, I'm just trying to put together in my mind, how would you do this? Uh, and I think what we'll do, and, um, and I'm sort of having this conversation with, uh, you know, Chair Brannon and Chair Ku. I think what we'll do is we'll bring on the administration. They'll give their testimony. And then 
Uh, I will ask some questions. I'll keep them pretty brief. I'll probably, you know, uh, relegate my question just to the oversight topic because I think I want to make sure that people who have bills on get to ask questions about their bills without me uh, going on and on about them. And then we'll uh, you know bring on uh, you know Chair Brannon. He'll ask whatever he wants to ask on whatever he wants to ask it on. Then we'll then we'll do the same with uh, Councilman Raku. And then I say I I, I proposed uh, to 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 Chair Brannon and to Chair Ku that we just bring on Public Advocate uh, Williams. After the three of us get to our do to do our thing, he can do um, HO 845. I'm sure he'll be um, economical in his questions because he knows that other members are waiting. And then we'll get into other members. Does that, does that sound like a like a strategy that works uh, for for you, Justin? For you, Peter, is that good? Sounds That's good. good. Let's do it. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Very good. Yes. And uh, uh, with that, we'll, uh, uh, yeah, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Koo. And with that, we'll uh, bring on the administration in whatever order they wish to testify. Somebody will uh, swear them in. It says my internet connection is unstable. I hope people can still hear me. Now it's not saying that, so maybe I'm fine. Um, so we will um, have whatever council is going to step up and swear in the administration. And then, yes. and then the... Um, administration in whatever order they wish to proceed can give their good testimony. Okay. Yes. So I guess uh, I'll chair. call upon the committee council to um, get that going. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. I'll just run through a few uh, of our routine procedural items. And of course, you and the co-chairs are, are welcome to alter it as, it, as, as the hearing goes. But I will uh, just go through our typical uh, procedures. Um, as uh, the chair mentioned, uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation. And I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. So please listen to your name for your name to be called as I'll periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. We'll first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. We'll be generally lim limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we'll be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you are called on to uh, testify, please begin by stating your name and the organization you represent, if any. As Chair Gennaro mentioned, we'll now call on representatives of the administration to testify. So appearing today for the administration will be Vincent Sapienza, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency, Angela Licata, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, Liam Cavanaugh, first Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation. Jennifer Greenfeld, Assistant Commissioner for Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources of the Department of Parks and Recreation. Merritt Larson, Chief of Natural Resources, Department of Parks and Recreation. At this time, I'll administer the affirmation to each representative. I'll call on each of you individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hands. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Sapienza? I do. Thank you. Director Babishi? Yes, I do. Thank you. Deputy Commis Commissioner Licata? I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh? Yes. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Greenfeld? I do. Thank you. And Chief Larson. I do. Thank you. At this time, I will now invite Director Bavishi and Commissioner Sapienza to present their testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. I would like to thank Chairs Gennaro, Brandon, and Koo for the opportunity to testify today. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues from the Departments of Environmental Protection and Parks and Recreation who will join me in responding to your questions today. 
As you know, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency is responsible for ensuring that New York City is prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change. Our role is to lead the city's strategic direction and planning to prepare for extreme events and the chronic impacts of climate change and coordinate, coordinate with agencies to implement this work. Within our citywide resiliency portfolio, the city is preparing to adapt to a variety of climate hazards. Our climate adaptation strategy, strategy takes a multi-layered approach, focusing on establishing multi, multiple lines of defense and diff different scales across the city to respond to the multiple hazards. Thanks to Chair Brannon and the Council's leadership on Intro 1620 this month, we also look forward to providing a climate adaptation plan in 2022 that evaluates the impacts of the various climate hazards that New York City faces, incorporates the latest findings in climate science, and articulates and builds consensus around a climate adaptation strategy. This is a significant step forward that will ensure continuous strategic and transparent leadership that helps the city become even more resilient to the threats caused by climate change. In the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Ida, the mayor launched the Extreme Weather Task Force, bringing together every deputy mayor and over a dozen city agencies and mayor's offices to outline immediate and long-term actions that the city will take to protect New Yorkers from future intense precipitation events. The resulting report, The New Normal, Combating Storm-Related Extreme Weather in New York City, lays out $2.1 billion in new funding at the Department of Environmental Protection for capital projects and an additional $238 million in accelerated funding for crucial DEP projects. Additionally, it outlines $400, uh, $400 million in new funding for other priority capital projects among key agencies, including the Parks Department, Department of Transportation, NYCHA, and School Construction Authority, as well as $25 million in expen expense funding for fiscal year 2022. These, fundings, these funds are critical for mitigating stormwater flooding and funding programs, science-based tools, and resilience capacity. We are also actively advocating for additional funds from the state and federal governments to further strengthen this work. The new normal includes a holistic set of resiliency commitments to address extreme weather spanning multiple sectors, including infrastructure, residents and businesses, and science and data. The infrastructure commitments in the new normal are innovative and accelerate solutions that were outlined in the city's stormwater resiliency plan that was released earlier this year. The commitments also reflect a focus on both gray and green solutions. The city is developing and will implement where feasible a new drainage standard informed by projected future rainfall data. We are also advancing innovative cloudburst solutions. These are projects which are designed for heavy downpours that transform open space and streetscapes to absorb water where possible and store excess water safely until the event passes to take pressure off the sewer system. The city has committed to developing a framework to transparently select priority neighborhoods for cloudburst projects, considering both indicators of physical risk, such as topography, subsurface conditions, land use, and recent complaint and damages data, and socioeconomic factors, including income, demographics, and access to existing green space. Four cloudburst projects will begin work next year, while the city pursues state and federal funding to implement additional projects. In addition, we are implementing the East Harlem Cloudburst Resiliency Project, a project that was identified in the vision plan for Resilient East Harlem in 2020. We are also expanding NYCHA's green infrastructure program to seven new sites, adding new green infrastructure in parks for stormwater management, and developing 20 new stormwater management playgrounds with the Trust for Public Land. Finally, we are implementing three priority projects in the New York City Wetlands Management Framework in the Bronx and Queens and Daylighting Tibbetts Brook in the Bronx. For residents and businesses, the city is committed to expanding flood help and why to inland areas and restarting home resiliency audits and financial, financial counseling to one to four family buildings and vulnerable multifamily buildings. These proven services were previously only available to certain Sandy affected areas. We will also be investigating the impacts of extreme weather on the city's housing stock and social infrastructure, reviewing electrical, plumbing, and zoning codes for the opportunity to address intense rain and coastal flooding, and expanding the SBS Small Business Preparedness and Resiliency Program to over 1,000 businesses. Additionally, the city was recently awarded funds by FEMA to conduct a backwater valve study to determine exactly where backwater valves will be effective. The results of the study, which we hope to complete next summer, will inform the scale of the city's installation program, areas of prioritization, and direct community outreach by clearly delineating what types of buildings and locations would most benefit from backwater valves. The study will also indicate where the city should immediately implement its new backwater valve program based on current high risks and, identified, and, and, and needs and identify areas of lower risk where the program should expand. 
For the science and data collection commitments, the city will expand the flood sensor network citywide, improve existing flood maps to account for combined flood risks, and develop a coastal flood vulnerability index. The city's flood sensor network, which currently operates in the pilot neighborhoods of Gowanus, Brooklyn, and Hamilton Beach, Queens, captures real-time data on flooding. Expanding these flood sensors will improve the city's real-time situational awareness, alerts, future forecasting, and long-term planning, while also facilitating community emergency preparedness and response during a storm. Additionally, updating and integrating flood maps will allow us to account for multiple hazards such as star stormwater, groundwater, and coastal flooding to help the city design the most resilient interventions for these compounding challenges. Finally, developing a coastal flood vulnerability index that is similar to the city's heat vulnerability index will make vulnerability to coastal flooding more transparent and help policymakers determine how to allocate limited resources equitably. Finally, there are many avenues to improve public policies at all levels of government, and we are committed to advocating on behalf of all New Yorkers for a more resilient city. At the city level, we believe that there is an opportunity for council to integrate sea level rise into building code as soon as FEMA finishes revising their flood insurance rate maps. Particularly in light of Hurricane Ida, we also see an opportunity to codify a permanent city-funded Office of Climate Resiliency, which will help define clear, transparent leadership for our already significant portfolio of work and the new mandates outlined in Intro 1620. We also expect that the city's resiliency portfolio will grow tremendously over the next few years due to the proposed New York State Environmental Bond Act and funding bills that are currently being considered in Washington only furthering the need for a resiliency-focused office with a clear, transparent, and distinct charge. At the state level, there are also tremendous policy opportunities. We hope to advance a flood risk disclosure mandate for real estate transactions to increase market transparency and develop new financing tools such as PACE with resiliency to support commercial building retrofits. At the federal level, we are con continuing to advocate loudly to increase affordability and transparency of the National Flood Insurance Program in light of the recently implemented risk rating 2.0 changes. We are also advocating to reform existing programs through which federal infrastructure dollars will likely flow, like FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program known as BRIC, so that we can make the most of future federal funding. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committees on Resiliency and Waterfronts, Environmental Protection, and Parks and Recreation for allowing me to testify here today. I look forward to answering your questions about the critical commitments outlined in the New Normal Report. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Babishi. Uh, we'll hear from the next uh, person uh, who's scheduled to testify from the administration, whoever that is. Whoever is next uh, scheduled to yeah. testify from the administration okay, uh, should... Uh, that, that, thank you, Chair. I've been un, unmuted. It's, uh, I'll, I'll start my testimony now. Thank you. So good afternoon, Chair Gennaro, Chair Brannon, Chair Kuhn, oh, members, sure. members of the Committees on Environmental Protection, Resiliency and Waterfront, and Parks and Recreation. My name is Vincent Sapienza. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the topics of combined sewer overflows, green infrastructure, and urban flooding. These issues are critical to the work of DEP and our mission to enrich the environment and protect public health for everyone who lives and works in New York City. As many of you are aware, DEP delivers approximately 1 billion gallons of drinking water each day from a watershed that extends more than 125 miles from the city. In addition, we maintain over 7,000 miles of water mains, 7,500 miles of sewer mains, 96 pump stations, and 14 in-city wastewater treatment plants. While the water and wastewater systems were built as a marvel of engineering creativity and determination, this critical infrastructure was built for a vastly different climate reality. Our team continues to make systematic improvements, planning for a wetter future while balancing several different goals. We are simultaneously reducing combined sewer overflows to improve harbor water quality, mitigating flood, flooding to reduce property damage and protect human life, and maintaining a state of good repair to ensure the longevity of our infrastructure. I commend all of our staff for what they have accomplished over the years and recognize that we still have more to do. There's a saying that climate change is water change. A water, water climate, warmer climate impacts nearly every facet of the water cycle, which impacts nearly every facet of work. DEP has always designed our systems with built-in redundancy, flexibility, and design criteria for extremes. For instance, We've known 
that uh, an uninterrupted clean drinking water supply is essential, dating back over 100 years, planners have and engineers have considered the possibility of droughts and heavy rain events. As much as possible, our drainage systems are also sized for heavy rain. And while we know that there are limits to engineered solutions for extreme events, we also recognize that there's an opportunity for innovation and progress. I'll begin the discussion about harbor water quality improvements and combined sewer overflows or CSOs. Much of our city's sewer infrastructure is a combined sewer system, which means that the sewer collects stormwater and sanitary sewage in the same pipe. Many older municipalities have a similar system. This combination of stormwater and wastewater is carried to one of our 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities, WRRF, where it is treated and clean water is released into the harbor. The city has invested billions of dollars in the design, construction, and upgrade of critical wastewater infrastructure across all five boroughs. The results are astonishing. We're proud to say that because of our investments, the water surrounding New York City are cleaner and healthier than they've been in 150 years since the Civil War. The improvements are apparent, are apparent every time a seal, dolphin, or whale is sighted off our shores. On a dry weather day, our WRRFs receive about 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater, and they have the capacity to treat up to 3.8 billion gallons a day. During some st uh, storm events, the volume or intensity of the rain can exceed the capacity of the local sewer network. When this happens, excess flow is diverted into a local open waterway, and that is known as a CSO. These releases are authorized by US EPA and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC. The city has over 400 CSO outfalls throughout the five boroughs, and they function as critical infrastructure, protecting the treatment process at our WRRFs and ensuring that they continue to treat sewage consistently after the rain ends. They also help to prevent stormwater and wastewater from backing up into homes and neighborhoods. These CSO releases, however, can, can hamper the water quality or water quality improvement goals, especially in constrained tributaries like the Hutchinson River in Newtown Creek. We remain dedicated to building off of our successes and further reducing CSOs to improve water quality in these water bodies. In recent years, we have spent nearly $3 billion in gray infrastructure projects like the Alley Creek CSO storage facility and the Gowanus Canal flushing tunnel and pump station re reconstruction. In 2012, we kicked off the long-term control plan or LTCP process with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and stakeholders to develop 11 long-term control plans for the water bodies that are impacted by CSOs. The LTCP work is consistent with federal CSO policy and the water quality goals of the Clean Water Act. Through this program, we have committed more than $6 billion in projects that will further reduce the volume and frequency of CSOs for those water bodies that do not achieve applicable water quality standards. Planning and design are already underway for many of those investments. I want to emphasize that the capital costs for CSO reductions are not linear. While billions have been spent so far, it will take tens of billions of dollars to eliminate CSOs. As a result, we have embraced a hybrid approach to CSO reduction, strategically incorporating gray infrastructure, which is very energy intensive and, and expensive to maintain, and balancing it with green infrastructure, which makes our city more permeable and absorb rain right where it falls. We believe that this hybrid approach is a much more sustainable and cost-effective path forward. So it's a little bit about green infrastructure. Uh, one component of the CSO reduction program is green infrastructure, or GI, with a goal of reducing CSOs by 1.67 billion gallons a year. GI is engineered to absorb and hold stormwater on site, preventing that water from entering the traditional sewer system. Keeping stormwater volumes out of the sewer system reduces stress on the WRRFs and cuts CSOs into waterways. New York City has implemented the most aggressive green infrastructure program in the country. In the last decade, our GI program has constructed more than 11,000 assets, managed more than 1,500 acres, added more than 660,000 square feet of pervious surfaces to streets and sidewalks, and created more than 14,000 acres of blue belts across the city. Many of the projects have been done in partnerships with other city agencies, including the Department of Transportation, Department of Parks and Recreation, NYCHA, and schools. GI takes many forms. The suite of options allows us to use Best options for each geography. GI includes large projects like Tibbetts Brook Daylighting and small distributed projects like rain gardens, infiltration basins, stormwater green streets, green roofs, blue roofs, permeable pavement, 
subsurface detention systems, and rain barrels and cisterns. Work is not confined, combined to, this, confined to, the, to the combined sewer areas. We have built more than 70 blue belts across Staten Island are expanding the program into Queens and the Bronx. All of these projects are engineered to make land and buildings more efficient at managing stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and the sidewalks have been our most widely used tool. And in addition to carefully designed vegetative pallets at their surface, they involve specially engineered systems installed below the surface. The subsurface structure is designed to store and then slowly percolate the captured runoff into the ground. This subsurface feature is the most critical part of the rain garden and what distinguishes them from a standard tree pit. It also makes them much more difficult to construct. Rain gardens are not feasible in locations where bedrock or high water tables uh, are, are there and where, or where utilities or the street and sidewalk infrastructure prevent us from using the space for stormwater management. Where rain gardens are not feasible, the EP has been working with New York City DOT on the installation of permeable street pavement to absorb runoff. As noted in the extreme storms management report that the mayor released last month, we are now significantly accelerating the use of permeable pavement. In addition to the work that DEP does directly, we encourage others to implement green infrastructure through financial incentives. The green infrastructure program funds the design and construction of green roofs on private property. Most recently, the Brooklyn Navy Yard added more than 23,000 square feet of green roof with funding from the grant program. To date, we've provided more than $13 million to 33 private owners for green infrastructure. We've also kicked off a $53 million contract to retrofit privately owned large impervious properties with green infrastructure. We are also developing the unified stormwater rule, which will require more on-site stormwater management for new or redeveloped properties that connect to the city sewer system. The unified rule will also require green infrastructure implementation on redevelop lots of more than 20,000 square feet or larger, or create 5,000 square feet of new impervious area, leading to more pervious and resilient properties across the city. While the primary goal of the GI program is to reduce CSOs in a cost-effective way, the projects also provide community and environmental benefits. These co-benefits include increased urban greening, urban heat island reduction, and more habitat for birds and pollinators. It's been on flooding now. While the total amount of rainfall in the city has not changed in the past two decades, it is apparent that climate change is causing more significant brief downpours or cloudbursts. Our sewers were designed to handle lots of runoff, but not all at once. Intensity is what causes flooding. Simply replacing existing combined sewers with bigger, deeper ones is imprudent. We must take a holistic approach to reduce flooding. Our current four-year capital plan includes $2.3 billion for 278 projects to improve drainage that includes new tools like non-networked high-level storm sewers and expanding our GI programs. As Director Bavishi mentioned, we are collaborating with the mayor's office and our agency colleagues on innovative solutions on cloudburst flooding. We already have three cloudburst projects in Queens that are in the design phase, one with NYCHA in the South Jamaica houses and two in St. Albans. We're supporting the efforts to identify cloudburst neighborhoods by performing a physical and social vulnerability assessment, which will be followed by an engineering feasible feasibility study for the Cloudburst neighborhood opportunities. We look forward to working with you all uh, and external stakeholders across the city as the program develops. Uh, finally, I wanna speak about the bills being heard today. We appreciate the importance of the issues raised by these pieces of legislation and look forward to working with the council to address critical needs across the city. Um, I'll go through each of the bills just quickly. Intro 1618 would require DEP to report on the progress of reducing pollution in city waterways that's caused by combined sewer overflows and stormwater runoff. We would like to work with the council to ensure that the bill aligns with current DEP reporting, reporting requirements. For example, DEP provides quarterly updates on LTCP implementation, reports on CSO discharges each year through an annual CSO BMP report, and submits yearly progress updates on water quality improvement strategies in the green infrastructure annual report and the stormwater management program annual report. All of these reports are submitted to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and are available to the public on the DEP website. Water quality data from our Harbor mm -hmm. Survey monitoring program is also available on NYC Open Data. Intro 383 would require DEP to submit an annual report on drainage infrastructure as with 1618, we would work with the council to ensure that the bill does not conflict with existing state or federal reporting. For example, DEP already complies with the state pollution 
discharge elimination system or speedies permits and applicable law by reporting to the state and the public discharges of untreated or partially treated sewage using the state's approved electronic public notification system, NILER. Intro 67 will place liability on the city for sewer service lines and require the city to develop a plan to mitigate and prevent sewer backups. EEP has done extensive work to reduce sewer backups and SBUs. SBUs are down 70% in the last decade. We regularly report to EPA on our progress and also release an annual state of the sewage report, which is available on the DEP website. We have initial concerns about the fiscal and legal ramifications of shifting liability of sewer service lines to the city, and we're still reviewing that with the law department and OMB. The unnumbered pre-considered uh, intro would require DEP to establish a program to provide financial assistance for the purchase and installation of backwater valves. We agree with council that backwater valves are an important tool uh, in the toolkit for homeowners needed to reduce flooding on their property. While DEP uh, does have experience providing financial assistance for home upgrades through our toilet rebate program and rain barrel giveaway programs, providing assistance for backwater valves uh, is of a different nature. Uh, we need to consider this proposal with the law department and the office of management and budget before committing to a citywide backwater valve program. We look forward to engaging with the council and sharing the results of MOCR's backwater valve study, which will become available next year. The study will review where backwater valves will be most efficient and consider equity and costs as it relates to prioritized imp implementation. Intro 2168 will require DEP to create a searchable database that would allow members of the public uh, access to private customer information. Implementation of this bill would make customer data available to third parties without consent. This would result in a serious breach of customer privacy and does not align with industry best practices. Ensuring customer privacy is an important safety measure, particularly for vulnerable homeowners whose presence at home could be tracked by these third party entities. We're also concerned that customers with large debts could be targeted by predatory actors who could ac access their account information. Protecting customer water and sewer data is a critical guiding principle in the development of our new billing system, which was launched last month. The system is not designed to be searchable by the public. However, customers can designate a third party delegate to access their billing information. We will gladly sit with the council to discuss our concerns about this bill in more detail once the law department has thoroughly reviewed it. Uh, lastly, I recognize that intros uh, 2425 and intro 1845A were both recently added to today's agenda. These bills would require DEP to create a borough commissioner position uh, and to inspect catch basins annually. We look forward to reviewing the language more closely and I'll follow up with you. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Before I close, it's important to remind everyone that the city's drainage infrastructure is funded directly from water and sewer bills that all New Yorkers pay, whether directly or indirectly. Each spring, DEP consults with the city council on our expense and capital needs for the coming fiscal year. And each year we hear public testimony about the impact of rising water rates on finances, for families, and small businesses. We must continue to make strategic investments while maintaining affordable rates, minimizing payment delinquencies and supporting low-income New Yorkers especially as we all continue to recover from the economic challenges of the pandemic. Without federal and state fundings, we must prioritize and balance our long-term planning with public affordability. Again, appreciate the council's commitment uh, to working with us on these complex issues. My colleagues and I are now happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. And at this point, I'll turn it back to Chair Gennaro and the other chairs for uh, statements and questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh... Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I certainly appreciate that. So I guess there's nobody else from the administration that has prepared that uh, has a prepared statement. Is that right? Is that right? No one else from the administration uh, is, is seeking to be heard with a prepared statement. <clears throat> okay, good. So uh, uh, I'll continue. And, and what, I'll, what I, what I uh, wish to do is uh, be, you know, with, 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 with so many members on and so many bills to talk about, you know, I feel compelled to, you know, reduce my own questioning because um, uh, I, I get the opportunity to have, to have access to, have, you know, uh, you, and all these commissioners. And I, I you know, always like to encourage the cooperation of members and I look forward to their uh, input. So I will be sparse with my questioning in order to give time uh, to the other two chairs and to 
the sponsors of, um, of, of, of the bills that are before us today. <clears throat> I'm just going through the, I made notes in the statements. I know that I have prepared questions, but uh, uh, I, I've gone through the statements of both um, <clears throat> you know, witnesses. And so this would be a question for uh, uh, Director Bavishi. Uh, uh, you're online, right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, just, just in going through your statement, you indicated, and uh, I'll quote from your statement, uh, quote, we also see an opportunity to codify a permanent city-funded office of climate resiliency, which will help define clear, transparent leadership, so on and so forth. Uh, we did that already. Uh, back when I took the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability and created as it created it as a permanent part of the mayoral team because they didn't want that to end with Mayor Bloomberg. They wanted that to be a a, a, a you know, permanent part of the mayoral team, which of course that office spoke mostly to sustainability. But when I created that bill, when I when I created that when I created the office in law, I also I also uh, you know mandated that a city office of resiliency also be part. Of, uh, of of the permanent part of the mayoralty. So being that being that we've, we being that the council has already mandated by law that an office of resiliency be part of the mayoralty. I'm not sure what you're getting at in terms of a, a city office of climate resiliency. It is my contention that now that the mayoralty uh, is 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 uh, mandated to uh, this office, this office of resiliency, is mandated to speak to the city's, you know, resiliency concerns. I don't know why you're calling for us to create that which has already been created. Because once we created the office of resiliency, it should do whatever resiliency, uh, you know, it, it, it you know, it, it, it should follow resiliency wherever it needs to go. And and, and so. So why the request for us to create an office that already exists? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Gennaro. And, and let me just clarify. So currently there is no um, authorized uh, uh, or chartered office, I should say, that's specifically focused on resiliency. Um, your leadership- Yes, there is. Yeah, yeah, yes, there is. We, we did that. It's just like when I wrote the law that created a, a, a permanent you know, uh, um, uh, a, 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 a permanent office of sustainability. It also created an office, a permanent office of resiliency. So I know what I'm talking about here, and I don't, I don't get it. So I reject your statement that this is not already in place. And if it's not already in place, how could it not be when it was already mandated by it was already mandated by law ten years ago? Um, well, I, 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 uh, I, I certainly don't mean to say that you don't know what you're talking about. I've also looked at- Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and I, I don't intend to. I, um, you know, I've all I've also um, studied the charter on this, um, and uh, my understanding, um, and I'm happy to follow up with your office on this, is that the charter currently has um, an office of long-term planning and sustainability, which includes both responsibilities related to sustainability and resiliency. And um, if, if you could just uh, Accept that premise for a second. I can explain sure. why we're asking for this. Um, you know, the the, res the resiliency responsibilities of OLTP OLTPS have grown. They range from um, publishing the stormwater resiliency plan, coordinating with the New York City Panel on Climate Change, developing a resiliency scoring system for the climate resiliency design guidelines, and then most recently uh, developing a climate adaptation plan um, as, as was established um, through Interest 1620 just recently. Um, and so as additional responsibility and scope is added to this office, particularly in light of Hurricane Ida, um, we think there's an opportunity to create clear, transparent, and consistently funded leadership that's exclusively focused on resiliency. Um, additionally, you know, while our office's goals can sometimes overlap with those of the Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability, our work is fundamentally different, um, and the design of our office uh, partners and projects and scope should be understood that way. It sounds like we're quite aligned on this, um, it, given that you believe that this has already been done. Um, uh, so like I said, I'm happy to follow up with your office about this. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, because I, 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 it, 
um, uh, because once I, you know, once this became law, it was incumbent upon the Bloomberg administration to appoint a director of resiliency that worked hand in glove with the sustainability director. So again, I, I'm, I, 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 you know, hear the words you say, and we'll, you know, continue the, you know, conversation. But um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that calling for like more bureaucracy is, is is really in order here. You know, now that the mayor's office has, you know, direct responsibility over resiliency, it should fund whatever it needs to fund in order to do that. And so let me just sort of move on. This is also in your statement, uh, on the first page of your statement, uh, also quoting from your statement, the new normal combating um, you know, the, 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 the report, new normal combating storm related, uh, um, uh, you know, weather in New York city lays out 2.1 billion in new funding for DEP and so on. And I'm wondering if any of that 2.1 billion, uh, will be, you know, directed to the people of Southeast Queens that at this moment, you know, still have no sewer, uh, that, that have, that have no storm sewer infrastructure, uh, um, um, at all. You know, to me, as I stated in my opening statement, that is one of the biggest gaps that we have and one of the biggest, um, you know, I mean, when, when people, you know, try to make the point that there is like a racial, you know, element to, you know, climate justice and whatever and to, uh, um, and to environmental adjustment uh, and to um, environmental justice, it, it would seem to me <clears throat> That there are parts of uh, you know Southeast Queens, you know, not my district, but you know, in you know, Southeast Queens, in 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 my home borough, um, that don't have any storm that don't have any storm infrastructure whatsoever. It seems to me that that would be you know Exhibit A on how this and other administrations have you know neglected the Southeast Queens community. Uh, that here we are in um, October of 2021, and there are you know, large swaths of Southeast Queens that have no storm sewer infrastructure whatsoever. Is any of that 2.1 billion going there? And, and I'll answer that question, Mr. Chair. So no, so no th th this is actually this, a separate pot of money that um, the mayor authorized going back to, to 2015 and, and has subsequently added that. There's a, there's a separate $2 billion that's uh, allocated. Work has been already uh, underway for several years. So, several projects are finished. Uh, more to come for Southeast Queens. But yeah, I mean, we certainly agree with you that that was a long, has been a long underserved community. Right. And, 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 yeah. and then, uh, you know, uh, um, one of the things I deal with on, on, on like a, on a very frequent basis is, you know, uh, uh, you know, members that are poised to become new members of the council and they're from, you know, Southeast Queens. And oh, I was chair of the committee a long time ago and I didn't know that I'm chair now. And they say, that, you know, like large swaths of the district that I'm going to represent, you know, come January, you know, don't have storm sewers, you know, and they ask me, you know, like when the build out date is going to be. I mean, I, I don't want you to like pull a number out of the air, but, you know, when is the build out going to be done? So at least everybody in New York City has some measure of storm sewer capacity, some, you know, you know, some storm sewer service in their in their neighborhood. If, yeah. if you're an adventure guest, are we talking five years? Are we talking 10 years? Like, what are we talking about? Yeah, we're, we're probably talking more than 10 years. And, and the reason, Mr. Chair, is, as you said, there was no storm sewer system there at all. And, you know, the, the sewer system is, is configured the way of like a tree. It has uh, small branch sewers on, on local streets that feed into larger limb sewers on avenues and then into bigger trunk sewers. You got to build the trunk sewers first, which is the first part of the, you know, what the mayor's... Uh, authorized us to do. So those trunk sewer projects are underway. There's four of them. And then eventually we will build out the limbs and the branches. We, we've done some work uh, on some local streets that really were, were impacted significantly by flooding and work with the Department of Design and Construction to, there, there were, we call the 50 hotspots and try to address those ahead of the full sewer build out. So we've, we've addressed some of those. Um, but it, it's going to take more than 10 years to, to finish. Uh, the work. Okay, but I, I'll, I'll just say just to say that we're talking about like new and innovative stuff we're doing for the rest of the city in terms of the in, in, in terms of the high level sewers, in terms of the cloud burst kinds of initiatives. And, you know, these people still don't have anything. And so, um, 
So, you know, other areas of the city are being upgraded while these other areas like don't have anything. And that's that that's um, uh, that's a, a very hard thing for me to be able to sell new members or for me to sell to to anyone. But I certainly appreciate your 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 um, your um, statement on that. I'm still on uh, Director Bavici's statement. I'll try to be. Um, and uh, second, uh, where are we? The second page of Director Bavici's statement. Uh, the city's developing and will implement where feasible a new drainage standard informed by the projected future rainfall data. Now, uh, you know, many on this, you know, many who are tuned into this hearing know uh, that the, you know, drainage standard, and, and, um, and I think what you're getting at is that, like, a lot of the city is at, you know, 1.75 inches per hour, other parts of the city at 1.5 inches per hour, and other parts of the city are still at one inch per hour in terms of water that they can, uh, the water that can be assimilated in a, uh, um, into the sewer system. Uh, now, in terms of new drainage standard, are you talking about something that will go beyond the 1.75, uh, you know, drainage amount that, that that the city has and well, that's been the standard for the last 50 something years. But is that what you're getting at here? That when you talk about a new drainage standard, you mean you know capacity of water that can be assimilated into the sewer per hour? I got a funny feeling that Vinny's gonna jump in on this answer, but my question to you being that it's, you know, it is to you because it was in your statement. Um, I'm happy to start and then, and then I will pass it off to Commissioner Sapienza. Mm -hmm. So um, let me start with the science. Um, what we have now is um, a sense of what areas of the city um, are vulnerable to intense precipitation, but what's lacking is better projections of um, intensity of rain. And so um, the first step here is to, to develop those projections and we'll, we'll be developing those. Um, uh, th that was actually one of the, the commitments in the Extreme Weather Task Force report. So we'll be um, working with DEP on that as, um, as well as uh, um, the science community. Um, I am going to defer to, to Vinny on um, exactly how we'll use those. Yeah, but, well, but, but if, I, 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 um, if I may, what, what, in your statement, you're talking about the development of a new drainage standard, and that either is sort of, you know, increased, you know, capacity um, in terms of the amount of rain that can be assimilated per hour, or it isn't. And it's Hard to do that in just various places because if you build out a bunch of big sewers that can take more than one and three quarter inches per hour, as soon as that gets to the next part of the city, it's going to get all jammed up. So, so right now I'm 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 unclear with this new drainage standard, and I suspect that you're not very clear on it. So I'll ask Vinny then. So, like, what is what does that mean, the new drainage standard? Yeah, Mr. Chair, so you're right. I mean, this goes back to the early 1970s when we. Uh, said what was the the typical five year storm in the city at 1.75 inches per hour and we've been building sewers to that size ever since but you know we certainly believe going forward uh, with climate change and more significant cloud bursts that that's probably not the five year storm anymore so we want to do that assessment but you're right building out sewers to to, to take more uh, more than that is going to be very challenging you, you talk about southeast Queens. There's great visuals that I think everyone should go look at of the installation of these new sewers that are going in there, these new storm sewers. They're not circular sewers anymore. They're what we call box sewers. They're rectangles that basically take up the whole street from curb to curb that are being dropped in. Massive. And that's to handle current current flows or current projections. Yeah. 1.75, you mean. Yeah. So, so, you, so, so what are you putting in? One point, so, so, so again... My question is, what is this new drainage standard? Like, what does that even mean? Yeah, so, so if we do determine that we've got to go beyond that, it may go beyond the traditional sewers because there's just you can't fit any bigger sewers uh, than, than we're putting in now, and it goes into these hybrid approaches. Making okay, all right. Permeable green infrastructure. Design. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I, I don't want to belabor it. And uh, um, let me... Um, uh, Director Bavishi, you talk about the money you got from FEMA to study the backwater valve study, and um, and you talk about like where these, you know, like 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 where these would best, you know, fit in. 
Um, the place where they best fit in is like my district where every house, including mine, had like a sewer backup. And so like the paradigm, and I don't want to, you know, necessarily speak for Councilman McBrannon because, you know, he's the first name uh, uh, um, on the bill. But I, I, I think just like the city saw that it was an imperative, this is like 25 years ago, you know, to reduce you know, to reduce, um, uh, uh, you, know, you know, water consumption. So the city, for its own purposes, put put um, put uh, toilets at its own expense in people's homes so that we would, so a, a city-funded fixture was going in a home. And this is kind of like the same paradigm. And this would save people those backups and it would save, you know, uh, the city from having to pay all the claims that people file when they get, you know, when their when their sewers all get when 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 their basements like fill with sewers. So, um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think we need a citywide approach on this. And although it's great to see where you know it, 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 they they might do the best good or whatever, but I mean, there were, this was this was all over the city. This was ubiquitous, and I I I. I, I I think this has to be like a blanket, you know, kind of approach rather than sort of like a here and there. We just have to kind of figure it out. And, 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 and because this is so, I mean, I don't think we need to wait for the next Ida and the Ida after that and the Ida after that. When we, you know, when the people have had it with Florida basements and they're storing the best deal, I, I think we need it now. I'll just leave that as, as my comment. And I think, I, got, I think that Chair Brannon is going to back me up on that. Um, moving to moving to your statement, um, Commissioner Sapienza. Um, let me see what notes that I made. You talked about how the um, uh, you know if the storm is big enough, when 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 you have combined sewers. You know, it is going to do, you know, create a situation where the water treatment plant is, is, is bypassed. And then, you know, you get into CSO situations. My understanding at that rate now is a storm of one tenth of one inch per hour would cause, uh, you know, diversion to CSO, which is not really kind of that much rain. And so, um, so this is a very, I mean, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the right statistic there. And um, so this is a, you know, is a you know, very common phenomenon. And so, you know, the city has, a, you know, has always had a big CSO problem and, and, and everybody knows that. So let me finally get to my question. Uh, now, you know, the city is regulated, you know, pursuant to, C, to, to CSOs as per your statement, you know, regarding the, uh, you know, many you know, um, speedies permits that you have. And so, uh, and, the non-compliance on CSO has no doubt resulted in, uh, you know, consent degrees, um, you know, with the DSC, they probably one or more or how many, but I mean, how is DEP doing with compliance with regard to the CSO, with, with regard to the consent orders that it's under for non-compliance with CSOs? So, and so uh, um, how many, you know, consent orders are there and sort of how are we doing with compliance? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with that. So we've been working with the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation since 2012, uh, developing these long-term control plans. Everyone understands with thousands of miles of combined sewers, 400 outfalls, uh, limitations on, on our wastewater treatment plants. It's gonna take a long time uh, to get where we need to be. But you know, I just bring up this statistic. You know, When I started here at DEP in the 1980s, we were discharging 100 billion gallons a year of untreated wastewater through CSOs. We're down to 18 billion now. So we've made significant progress, but certainly 18 billion is still a big number, long way to go. Uh, so we got that. I want to address the, uh, the 0.1 inches per hour, because I think a lot of people use that. So we have these 400 CSO outfalls. Some of them, and, and they, by the way, they each have their discrete drainage areas that, that they regulate. Um, some of them, yes, at 0.1 inches per hour, they do tip. Some of them can take much more than 0.1 inches per oh, hour. Fine. Many okay. of them, many of them, almost half of them now no longer discharge CSOs. So as the program moves along, we're doing better and better, but you know, certainly there's still a lot to do. Okay, but, but it, it, it would seem that you, it would seem that based on 
uh, you know, the lack of you saying that you're in compliance with all the consent orders means that DEP is out of compliance with consent orders. These consent orders that were negotiated that, you know, DEP signed and how we, so are we an A, are we a B, are we a C? And like, you know, if, if I were to go to D, and I know people at DC, I was a deputy commissioner there for six years. And so how are we doing with compliance in terms of the, in terms of the consent orders? No, you know, we've certainly had our challenges over the years. Uh, you know, there, there are many milestones, a lot of construction work that needs to be done. Uh, right now, we're in good shape. You know, we've, we've come to agreements with DEC on, on where we need to be on most projects. There are a couple of big projects that we're going to need to do for Flushing Bay and for Newtown Creek that are probably going to be a billion dollars a piece. And we're still trying to figure out, uh, you know, how quickly we can get those done. Uh, okay. Uh, with that... Um... With that said, I, I want to uh, uh, you know turn it over now to um, let me see what I'm going to do. I, I want to turn it over now to to uh, in Chair Brannon and then to uh, and then to Chair Koo and um, and uh, um, so they'll ask their questions on the oversight topic. On uh, on any uh, on, on any of the bills, and I want to you know thank you, Commissioner, for uh, you know uh, um, uh, testifying on 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 um, all the bills. But I, I think we I, I think we do uh, Chair Brandon, and then we do Chair Ku, and then as I said at the outset, maybe we get the public advocate uh, to do uh, you know to to ask some questions on uh, his bill um, eighteen forty five. And then we get the other members. I, you know, I, I apologize for, um, um, you know, making the members wait a little bit, but um, uh, um, uh, I'm sure that the public advocate will be uh, will be very um, economical in his questioning because we're allowing him to kind of jump the line a little bit um, out of respect for his uh, 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 schedule. And with that, I recognize Chair Brown. Pardon me, pardon me, chairs. Uh, I believe. Uh, uh, public advocate uh, Williams had an opening statement he'd like to make as well. If that's okay with the chairs, would he be able to jump in before additional questions? Uh, I, I'm not really, um, I, I'm not really comfortable putting him before the other chairs. I, 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 I say that we have, you know, Chair Brannon ask his questions, or, or uh, um, is it just a statement? He just wants to make a statement. I believe so, Chair. Uh, like other bill sponsors, uh, had that, that made a statement on their. Bill. Okay, so I, 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 um, I'm going to ask Chair Brown and and and, and Chair Ku if it's okay if we defer to the public advocate to make a statement. Yeah, and, and a uh, statement only. Okay. Yeah, I'm Is okay. That, Is that all right? Okay. Um, with that, I recognize the public advocate. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we got you. Uh, well, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it, uh, uh, Chair Gennaro. As, as, you, as I said earlier, it's good to be back in here with you. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Chair uh, Brandon and uh, Chair, Q, uh, Chair Ku, and of course, uh, the administration uh, for their testimony. And uh, Commissioner Sapienza, uh, I know I just missed you a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you for joining us at our event in Queens uh, earlier today. Uh, last month uh, served as a reminder that the city is still not prepared for climate change. Uh, at least 13 people died as a result of intense and sudden floods from Hurricane Ida. As so many died because they lived in basement apartments, highlights that there are multiple intersecting issues from housing to environmental justice that require city action. As I previously said, what we used to call extreme outlier events are now just storms that are new normal. Preparation is key, and I welcome this hearing to begin that work. Uh, that work can start with many of the bills that are here today, including mine, Bill Intro Number 1845, which would simply renew Local Law 48 of 2015. That law required the New York City Department of Environmental Protection to submit semi-annual reports on the state of its catch basins. Catch basins act as a drain for water to flow through while blocking any large debris. There are thousands of catch basins around the city, 
sometimes clogged with trash. DEP is required to clean up these basins, but that requires New Yorkers to help notify the agency of catch basins that need to be cleaned and are repaired. DEP was previously required to report on its inspections of catch basins, including those identified as non-functioning and requiring repair. DEP was also required to note the number of catch basins that need to be repaired within nine days of inspection or receipt of complaint. These reports were helpful as the last report found 4,300 catch basins were non-functioning from July 8, 2018 to June 2019. Unfortunately, DEP is no longer required to publish these reports. Uh, this bill would ensure the agency submits quarterly reports and fixes catch basins with five, not nine days of inspection or receipt of a complaint. These basins are essential in the event of flash floods, for example, and we just can't take a risk with the non-functioning basins. We need to pass the legislation to make sure DEP makes public data around the city's catch basins an effort we need to make sure before the session ends. Additionally, I appreciate the council's focus on green infrastructure, which consists of providing green jobs and ensuring neighborhoods are resilient against the worst of climate change. Uh, I am going to uh, pause here. There is some more I wanted to say, but I'm just thankful that uh, I was allowed the time to give the opening statement and I'll give it back to the chair, but uh, we're gonna submit our full testimony, uh, sorry, full opening statement uh, for the record. I know that uh, they may not have a response for our bill because they haven't read all of it yet, uh, but I much appreciate the, the time today and I hope we can get all of these bills passed. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you much, Mr. P uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Public Advocate. What we're gonna do is, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm going to call upon the administration. Uh, 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 you know, uh, I guess it'll probably be uh, uh, you know DP Commissioner Sapienza, but anyone else from the administration. Uh, you know, once you, uh, you know, once you're you know fully steeped in the public advocate's bill to um, reply, you know, to him to uh, comments on his bill and also to uh, you know reply to the staff of the um, committees that are on the call today. Is that okay, Vinny? You good with that? Yes, thanks. Okay, very good. Uh, 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 thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Always a pleasure to be with you. And with that, I recognize Council Member Pratt. Pardon me again, Chairs, for, sorry, pardon the Oh, interview. sure. Um, Council Member Salamanca is also one of the sponsors of the bill. Would like to make a brief uh, statement as well on this bill before we uh, proceed to other. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I tell you what. I mean, um, um, uh, now I'm I'm I, I'm uh, uh, speaking to Chair Brown and and uh, Chair Kud. We want to let all of those uh, sponsors of the various bills just make a little statement on on, on their bill. Is that does that work for yeah. you, Justin and Peter? That sounds good. All right. Good. And just to know, Council Member Sal. Okay, Sal so. Uh, a member to speak. Uh, 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 okay, with that said, I uh, uh, recognize Council Member Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Sure, we got you. All right, I appreciate the opportunity to give my brief statement. Um, you know, as we know, climate change is real. Uh, here in New York City, we have seen firsthand the devastating effects of the rising sea levels, warmer air, and sea temperatures and an increase in uh, in the person in our storms. We saw what Hurricane Ida and uh, Superstorm Sandy did. It showed us how vulnerable we are to storms that are not only capable of causing billions of dollars in damages in a matter of minutes, but can also cause a loss of life. Uh, as this uh, as these um, intense weather systems become exceedingly prevalent in the Northeast, it is even more critical than ever that we have comprehensive planning in place that delivers much needed resources and personnel to our communities. That is why I introduced intro 2425, which will require DEP to create and assign the position of borough commissioners within each borough. Like borough commissioners for the Department of Transportation, Department of Parks, and the Department of Buildings, personnel and facilities within the borough they are in charge of overseeing agency operations. Working hand in glove with local stakeholders, the borough commissioners would be decision makers and serve as the voice of the community with agency leaders at DEP central office and city hall. Ahead of major storms, DEP borough commissioners would be able to proactively direct personnel to known trouble areas to carry out preemptive work. Similarly, the borough commissioners will serve as a local point of contact for elected officials and community boards in post-storm recovery and relief. Unfortunately, storm city New York have become the new normal 
as hurricane seasons last longer and has grown in intensity. While we work to institute long-term solutions that will protect our city, we must also ensure we're providing our communities with the localized resources that they need in the short term. Creating DEP borough commissioners will do exactly that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to give out my, my, my statement. Uh, thank you, Council Member Salamanca, and thank you for um, putting this bill forward. I appreciate that. Um, is there any other sponsor of a bill on the docket uh, that is present that wishes to make a statement on uh, his or her bill? I mean, I know that that uh, you know Chair Brandon and, and you know Chair Ku have bills and they're going to speak on them. But you know, other than Chair Brandon and Chair Ku, is anyone present here today who who has a bill that wishes to make a statement, an opening statement? No, uh, there are no other sponsors. I uh, believe we can move on to the other co-chairs for their. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Mr. Council. Uh, uh, so with that, once again for. Many, many times, I, I, I recognize them a bunch of times, but uh, things, you know, got, got jammed and we went and we got sidetracked. And now I am recognizing Councilman Brandon for real. This is it. He's on. Thank That's you, supposed Chair. to be like funny. That's supposed to be like, you know, it's like levity, you know? I appreciate okay. that. I appreciate sure. that. Uh, thank you, Chair De Niro. Um, I know we got a lot to get into. So... I want to talk about my uh, Chair Gennaro and my bill um, for uh, to establish a program to provide financial assistance for the purchase and installation of backwater valves um, to Commissioner uh, Sapienza. Um, I know backwater valves are used to prevent overflow as a result uh, of backwater from the public sewer system. What we saw during Tropical Storm Ida, many basins were flooded from backwater from, from sewage pipes. Um, how much does backwater valve installation cost? Do you have an idea? We, we have a sense of how much the devices are, which are a few hundred dollars, uh, but then you know it depends upon how, what the plumber finds uh, when they get in the basement and the configuration, which you know could add several hundred to several thousand dollars. Is there, is there a typical uh, standard lifespan of one of these backwater valves? Not sure. I know that they require regular maintenance. Obviously, they're a mechanical device and they've got to be cleaned and serviced, but I don't know how long they last. Okay. And does the city believe that all buildings should have backwater valves? I think that's the study that uh, MOCR is doing to, to see where they make sense uh, and, and where they might not be practical. Uh, you know, we've certainly heard stories over the years where my tenant on the second floor flushed their toilet, not knowing that the valve was closed and it came out through the tenant's toilet in the basement. So I think that's part of the study, but uh, Director Bravici, if you wanna talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, I'd love to know how many buildings are part of that study. Um, so the, the study is gonna focus on building types and we, we wanna um, look at building types and where neighborhoods are located um, in terms of where they are in the, the sewer system. Um, there, we know that certain building types are too large for backwater valves um, and others that are located in parts of the sewer system um, uh, in parts of the sewer system where there actually could be some unintended consequences if, if these uh, backwater valves are installed. So our goal is to take a citywide look and understand where we should be prioritizing backwater valves and where they will be most effective um, so that we can tailor a program to households that would benefit the most and ensure that residents who need uh, need them the most um, will receive them. So do you do you collectively feel that the installation of backwater valves should be the responsibility of the city? I, I mean, I'll answer that. Uh, you know, we as you know, um, Chair Gennaro mentioned, uh, you know, we did what we call the toilet rebate program, where it was a benefit to the city to reduce uh, the amount of water being used to to, to help fund that. Um, you know, we may do a similar thing where there's a grant program uh, for, for, for homeowners to, to install these. Um, I think we just want to, again, go through the study to make sure where uh, they, they, you know, may be most beneficial or, or, or where not. So I think that's, we'd like to get some more information first. Okay. Um, the, moving on to the, the, um, the creation of a water meter database, so intro 2160, uh, 2168. Does DEP currently track 
uh, water uh, meter billing data and balances and, and um, you know, consumption usage and, and all that technical information about the meter? Yes, Mr. Chair. So we have that. And with the new automated, you know, meters, we, we can see stuff in real time uh, at properties. So we know what the consumption is. Uh, we have billing data, obviously, for the 840,000 uh, payers pay, paying accounts. Do you, do, does DEP think that this, the, a, the, what we're proposing a searchable database would be useful to taxpayers? So I guess the, the, the issue that we have, Mr. Chair, is that if, if property owners can see their own records and they can actually delegate to you know, a third party uh, you know, management company to, to look at that. A, a, our concern was just having records all, you know, every record available to anyone who wants to look. So you, know, you can see you know, when the Sapienza household does their wash and when they're not home. And so that's, that's the, the, the issue that we have. We have to have some controls on it. And, and that's what we want to you know, work with you on, on that uh, legislation. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Chair Gennaro asked about the, um, I know in 2015, the city partnered with Copenhagen to learn about techniques dealing with flooding from cloudbursts and extreme rain events. Um, can, can you discuss a little bit about what we learned during this partnership? And I know there was a pilot program in Southeast Queens. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Janie, do you want to start? And then uh, Deputy Commissioner Lakata is on as well, and she can talk about the actual project. Sure. Maybe just start. for you know for, for the public, you could just explain what it is really quickly. I mean, I know um, what it is, but you know, so everyone else does. Absolutely. So um, uh, we've been in a partnership um, with Copenhagen since 2015. Um, the partnership started because at the time, um, you know, Copenhagen had experienced an, an, an intense rainfall event in 2011. It was a thousand year rain event. Um, and we had experienced Hurricane Sandy. And so the goal was to exchange um, lessons learned um, respectively about intense precipitation and strategies to mitigate that kind of flooding um, from, from the lessons that Copenhagen had learned, um, as well as what we had learned on mitigating coastal flooding. Um, in particular, they um, uh, shared about their, their cloudburst strategies. And so cloudbursts Cloudbursts are heavy downpours, like what we saw uh, during uh, the storm last month with the remnants of Hurricane Ida, um, where uh, we see intense precipitation in a short amount of time. And essentially, the strategies that we can use to mitigate these cloudburst events um, involve uh, using open spaces, streetscapes, recreational spaces, and transforming them into areas that can um, store excess stormwater and take pressure off the sewer, sewer system um, or, or absorb stormwater if, if it is in, in fact a green space. Um, and so we have been piloting those strategies as Commissioner Sapienza mentioned in his testimony um, in, uh, in, in uh, Queens. Um, and uh, what we did in the Extreme Weather Task Force report, the new normal report has made a commitment to expanding um, those strategies uh, based on um, those pilots um, and just the urgency of the work. Um, we're, the first step is going to be creating a framework that um, transparently uh, communicates um, the factors that we're going to consider uh, in the neighborhood's selection process, um, and those factors will include physical indicators of risk, um, things like complaint and damages data, um, density, land use, um, but also social indicators of risks, um, uh, you know, demographic data, um, income data, things like that. Um, so I will pass it off to my colleague, Angela Okada, in case she has anything to add. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd love to know more specifically about uh, Southeast Queens, the, Jamaica, the, the South Jamaica houses, and I know the, the second pilot project in St. Albans. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we are working very specifically. South Jamaica Houses has been one of our prototype locations, learning from um, the Danish. And in fact, I was on a trip there to Copenhagen to visually inspect uh, their demonstration projects. And we were very quickly able to take some of those examples that we learned from them and to apply them here. So I'm happy to say that the project at South Jamaica Houses is um, designed, it's funded, it's really ready to, to go. It's going to be a concept whereby we take a basketball court 
So a playing surface and an adjacent grassy area, and there will be a combination of reliance on infiltration and also storage. So that's really where the cloudburst concept comes in. We're going to be combining our green infrastructure techniques, which is to allow the water to infiltrate into the surface, but also to have excess capacity on the surface itself if that capacity is exceeded by an extraordinary storm event whereby the playing surface will be um, have double duty as a storage facility. Thank you. Um, can, can someone tell me to date what the city has spent on green infrastructure? Yeah, we have committed over $1 billion um, to our green infrastructure program. Um, and we had uh, began that program in the combined sewer area um, as a water quality technique, but quickly learned that we were draining a lot of areas and able through really good um, soil locations to infiltrate that stormwater and to have that provide um, added capacity for the drainage system. So we stopped looking at our drainage as sewers alone. We started to look at them as a drainage system and to combine the green infrastructure practices with the um, typical and standard uh, drainage sewers. So we really look at this not as a, a gray versus green um, opportunity, but really as an integrated plan. Okay, and the, the Cool Neighborhoods Initiative, is that fully funded? Cool Neighborhoods, our heat resiliency strategy? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I, I, there's, I think there's like 200 or 198 proposed uh, green infrastructure projects that are either in design or the early planning stages. Um, are any of those projects located in communities of color? So the, all of the rain gardens, um, which are about 90% um, of our green infrastructure program right now is on the right of way, just because that was the area that we could quickly access. Um, and about 90% of that 90% are in environmental justice neighborhoods. Um, and as we go forward, as Director Bavishi mentioned, that lens, looking at the social justice lens, is going to be one of the criteria for the desktop analysis before we even get into the field to determine um, what are the opportunities and what are the, the drainage um, necessities. Okay. Um, I just have one or two more because I know there's a lot of folks who, who want to ask questions. Um, coastal flood protection measures, I know they don't always protect against um, stormwater flooding and flooding from rain events. So what is the city doing to ensure that uh, such measures protect against both uh, coastal flooding and flooding from, from heavy rain? Is there anything new uh, being done to protect the, the functionality of, of CSO and the, the MS4 outflow pipes from, from sea level rise? Janie, you want to start? Well, I'll just say on coastal protection measures, um, every time we build a coastal protection measure, we also uh, make sure to analyze um, the, the drainage system that would be behind the coastal uh, protection measure and, and make any drainage improvements that are necessary so that we don't make um, uh, any kind of ponding or stormwater flooding worse um, because we're building the coastal protection. So essentially we don't wanna create a bathtub. So that's always part of the analysis um, and, and, uh, and, and you know, we're making investments as part of the um, coastal protection uh, measures that we are building um, to, to make those improvements. Um, I'll pass it off to Vinny on the more specific questions about nothing again. No, I, I, I think you answered it, Janie, and, and like on the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, the Staten Island barrier, the Rockaway barriers, uh, you know, we've been working with the Army Corps and DEC and others to make sure that uh, drainage is addressed. Um, regarding Local Law 48, 2015, it required DEP to conduct annual catch basin inspection. I know that law sunsetted in 2019. So how often are the catch basins inspected by DEP now? And I know a previous hearing we had, we spoke a little bit about how 
the, the clogged catch basins are certainly a problem, but but I think you know not sort of the smoking gun that's that the average me included that the average sort of uh, constituent might think. I mean, I mean, has DEP worked with sanitation to assess how reduced alternate side parking and, and related street sweeping has impacted the amount of materials in the catch basins? I'm just trying to get an idea of how often these are. I mean. You know, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, I speak to Mario Bruno more than I speak to my wife some weeks. So you guys are fantastic. Um, but it's it's a lot of being reactive, right? A constituent calls me and says, there's a catch basin full of trash. I'll call you. We'll get it cleaned out. That's not a problem. But what's being done proactively to, to clean out these catch basins? And, and I guess, and last thing is, why is that, even though I know it's an issue, but can you reiterate why you're sort of saying that it's not why we saw what we saw during Ida and Henri. Sure, and, and I think I'll, I'll start with that. So during um, you know, those extreme storms, um, the, the sewer pipes themselves reached capacity. So no more water could get into catch basins anyway, because the, the pipes were full and water just ran over land and unfortunately downhill um, into these low-lying neighborhoods and, and with, with really catastrophic uh, results. But, during that uh, three-year period where the, the, the legislation uh, was in place, uh, we were required to inspect all 148,000 catch basins once per year. Um, that was helpful um, in, in some ways, but not in others. And it, the reason it wasn't helpful in, in some respects is because there were catch basins, tens of thousands of them, in really residential neighborhoods that over and over again, we would go inspect them and they would be clean. There was no need uh, for, for any work. And so it kind of tied up resources. What we'd like to do going forward, and this is in the, the mayor's new report, is get out to the, the commercial uh, area catch basins more frequently, You know where there's a lot of stores, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of trash that gets on the streets. Um, we think that that probably is, is a better use of resources. But again, happy to work with the, the council and the public advocate to, to craft legislation. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it a, back to Chair Gennaro so the, Chair Koo can ask some questions. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Chair Brennan. Uh, uh, and uh, with that, I turn it over to, I, I recognize Chair Koo for a question. And also a, a, a statement on his bill as well. Yeah. Because um, he's got a very big bill in here too. So, uh, uh, Chair Ku, you're on. You Thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, Janelle. Can you, can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chair Janelle. Yeah. So, uh, I have uh, some questions uh, on intro 1618. Uh, I want to ask the commissioner of DEP, uh, this bill would require DEP to produce a number of reports, plans and studies related to sewage and stormwater contaminants in the city's uh, waterways. So I want to know the DEP's thoughts on the following reporting requirements uh, in the next legislation. Uh, such as the, the annual study and report on the presence of contaminants from combined sewage overflows uh, in New York City's waterways and DEP progress to work milestones uh, noted in the sewage overflow long-term control plan. And the second is an integrated watershed management plan for each waterway that is the subject of a combined sewage overflow long-term control plan. Uh, the third thing is a report identifying all technically uh, feasible opportunities to develop green infrastructure on public and private lands and structures within the sewer shacks draining to each respective waterway. And another uh, item is a study evalu evaluating the effectiveness of its current regulations for reducing the volume and weight of stormwater discharge from developed land and establishing a method to be used by the department to track the combined sewage overflow and stormwater pollution reductions. 
achieved by implementing uh, uh, implementing such standards. And lastly, a study on coordination treatments for raw sewage. I know it's a bunch of uh, uh, questions. Uh, can you give us a, an idea of what is your thought on those? Yeah, and, and thank you, Chair Ku. A lot of important information uh, that, that you described and we want to you know, make sure that the public has that, that information and as real time as possible and transparently. Um, uh, some of the information that you, you spoke about is already available in some reports that we do for uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, some quarterly reports and annual reports. Those are on our website, but wherever there are shortcomings, if you, know, if you feel that there's, there's more that's needed and you mentioned some of it, happy to work with you on the legislation to fill those gaps. Okay, so we will work with you, yeah. This bill also requires DEP to conduct an extensive public engagement process before finalizing the plans. And uh, what is the, does DEP support the public engagement process as outlined in the bill? Again, um... Chair Koo, I, I, we, we do, and I think we've had, you know, some good uh, public meetings over time. I, I'm going to uh, give it to this one to, to Deputy Commissioner Lakata because she's been involved with a lot of the, the work with the communities uh, and, and public hearings over the past and public meetings over the past several years. Angela? Sure. Um, yeah, we um, very much like to hear from the public. We very much welcome their input. We reach out um, quite often during the long term control plans themselves. We would reach out um, to kick off a watershed. We would then reach back out to talk about alternatives. And then we even added at the end, um, you know, a final a meeting to talk about the selected alternative that would be um, sent to the state DEC for approval. We were also doing citywide annual meetings. Um, and quite often, we will reach out to our stakeholders on our green infrastructure um, program. So we're very proactive to let them know about changes and modifications that may be required. Um, of course, we could always do better and we would be happy to, to hear your suggestions. And frankly, I would love if we could expand the stakeholder groups that we are meeting with on a regular basis so that we could expand um, the concerns that we're hearing from our constituency. As we we're talking about today, you know, the climate pressures and the response to resiliency um, sometimes competes with the water quality improvements. Um, and then hearing from those uh, that are concerned about affordable rates. So trying to get everybody in a room and to manage expectations and to recognize each other's challenges, I think would be a wonderful idea. Thank you. Yeah, we are very happy to work with you for this legislation. You know? So thank you for your good work and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my next few questions will be directed to the Parks Department, Parks Without Borders uh, Initiative. Uh, and what is the current funding level? Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, Ka Ka Chair Ku. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, Parks Without Border was an initiative developed under Commissioner Silver uh, to create more welcome, accessible, openings to parks, entrances to parks that connected better with the communities. Uh, there was $50 million allocated to the program initially, 40 million went into eight specific projects uh, in, in the boroughs that were chosen as a result of a nomination process that the public uh, participated in in a significant way. $10 million were, is, has been allocated to more general park design projects, park design and construction projects to add those elements of openness, accessibility, and community connections to those projects as well. Uh, so while it was not specifically a green infrastructure uh, driven program, it did capture resiliency as we do in all of our designs. 
uh, by addressing stormwater capture within the park and creating more permeable surfaces wherever we can. So one of the most projects low green infrastructure features will install. So council member, we have been working on green infrastructure for over 10 years now. We have a very uh, fruitful partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection. In 2014, at the start of the de Blasio administration, DEP approached us about investing specifically for green infrastructure in the community park initiative program. They, they allocated $36 million to the first phase of green of CPI sites that were built uh, you know, at the start of the administration, uh, including the playground at Bound Playground, uh, which is in your district and was one of the first phase uh, projects uh, that was built. We incorporated green infrastructure that removes stormwater from the surrounding streets and were processed in the park using three basic elements, rain gardens, permeable pavement, and underground storage systems. Uh, since that initial investment, uh, DEP has provided an additional $105 million for green infrastructure in parks that's being developed both by DEP directly and by parks. In fact, we have about $35 million worth of projects that will be going into construction starting now and over the next 13 or 14 months. Uh, they will provide green infrastructure uh, at 61 different parks in three boroughs and will eventually help us capture approximately 992,000 uh, cubic feet of rainwater for every storm event uh, of, of 1.2 inches and greater. Okay, thank you. So are, anyone, uh, are any of the Parks Without Borders projects located in communities of color? Uh, yes, they are, um, specifically Virginia Playground, uh, in the Bronx, uh, was definitely in a community of color. Um, I'm trying to remember <laughs> some of the other ones off the top of my head. Um, the, the, many of them were large regional parks that served multiple communities. For example, the Prospect Park entrance uh, on Flatbush Avenue serves both the east and, and um, sort of the south and north sides of the park. Uh, which hosts some very diverse communities. Um, Flushing Meadow Corona Park, of course, the entrance that was built there uh, services, services a very diverse community as well. So yes, that was definitely part of the, uh, the thinking behind the Parks Without Border initiative. Thank you. As you just mentioned, I'm funding a pilot program for uh, permeable tree pits along uh, Union Street in my district. However, uh, this is only part of the solution. Uh, does, does the city currently install permeable pavement? If so, does the city have a map of locations where it has, in, where it has installed uh, permeable pavement? Uh, yes, Chair we we do install permeable pavements. It's one of the elements that we uh, incorporate in park designs wherever it's feasible. It's not feasible in every instance. Uh, you need a certain uh, uh, you know, depth between either bedrock or the water table or other factors in order to, for it to work successfully. But it is an element that we use pretty consistently in parks, both to manage stormwater within the park, which is a requirement that Commissioner Sapienza referenced uh, with the uniform stormwater rule. It's an a draft form right now, and also to manage stormwater for the green infrastructure program. And that is when we bring water from the street into the park to be managed in the park and kept out of the sewer system. Uh, I don't know that we have a map, but we can certainly uh, develop a list of places where we have installed green infrastructure. And I wanna thank you for that pilot project on, on Union Street. Uh, it's really important that we give trees the best opportunity to survive and in busy commercial streets, the foot traffic uh, can really limit the amount of space where trees can, can access water. So having the permeable pavement in an area like that could be really beneficial uh, to our program in providing trees in those types of areas. 
Thank you. So um, after the flooding uh, from tropical storm Ida, many of the homeowners who saw it located in an area completely surrounded by Kisena Park. These homeowners have asked for the city to purchase their homes and return the space to Parkland. Is this something the city, the, is, this something the city is considering? Yeah, Council Member Ku, I know the mayor was out there himself uh, meeting with the, the, the homeowners. I know there's a, a pocket of homes that, uh, you know, was built in what, what was once a, a wet land area. Um, we, we are looking to see if there are drainage solutions for that, that location and working our best to do that. I know we've been approached by those homeowners and, and others, uh, some, some in, in, in Hollis section of Queens and uh, some in East Elmhurst about buyouts. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we've uh, you know, gotten too far into that assessment yet, but again, just trying to see if there's any drainage improvements that we can make in the near term. Yeah, because many of our homeowners, uh, they said they have experienced this every few years. So it doesn't make sense you know, for them to repair and then, and then they, um, a few years time, uh, um, now they don't know how us uh, FEMA or the agencies uh, um, to uh, uh, considering uh, it, it, Chair, uh, you, you you broke up a little bit, but I think I, I, okay. I got the gist. Yeah, I know that there there are some pockets of, of homes, and you know many of them are at the lowest point, you know, sort of the bottom of the drainage bowl that uh, that see flooding not only in in storms like Ida and Henri, but on a more regular basis and. Uh, you know, we want to take a good hard look at those and just see what, what are the best solutions. And I might also add that in um, parallel with the uh, analysis that Commissioner Sapienza mentioned, we're also advocating uh, for funding for voluntary buyouts from Congress. Um, after Sandy, there were uh, a number of buyout programs that um, were implemented by the city, state, and federal government, and they were all federally funded. Um, so similarly, we are um, advocating for, for funding to be able to offer a voluntary buyout program um, if, 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 in fact, it is needed. Thank you. So it seems like my internet is not that stable. So please bear with me. Uh, I don't know how to wait. Green infrastructure in more parks. We had complaints in our community by Kisena Park and also heard complaints from North East Queens, especially surrounding Golden Lake. As you know, my community, my community saw three deaths as a result of flooding due to tropical storm either in the neighborhood surrounded by all four sides in the neighborhood surrounding all, on all four sides by Kisena Park. Uh, other residents uh, with homes adjacent parks also saw damage and severe funding. Thank you. Uh. Hey, Chair, could you, br you broke up at the end and I don't think we heard the question. Oh, okay. So, so my, my question is, what is the parks, actually it's for parks, you know, Jim. Okay. What is the parks plan to incorporate green infrastructure in more parks? because of this severe damage suffered by homes surrounded by parks. So we had to do something in the parks to absorb all the water. Yes, Council Member Kuo, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, almost $100 million worth of green infrastructure projects funded by DEP. Many of them will be impl implemented by DEP in parks, 61 parks will be uh, will be in construction over the next 12 to 14 months. Uh, we do have four projects, green infrastructure projects, for Casena Park included in that. However, I want to be clear, uh, they were designed to handle 
sort of normal uh, rain events and, and the typical flooding you see, not the extreme uh, rainfall that, uh, that we saw as part of, uh, uh, of Tropical Storm uh, Ida, the remnants of that storm. Uh, I believe that DEP uh, may be uh, thinking about other possible solutions for places like Casina, uh, and I would ask uh, Commissioner Licata to perhaps speak about that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Surely. Um, so the commissioner asked us to put together an interdisciplinary team to really look closely at the casino problem, since you are so correct about the, um, the amount of devastating flooding that occurred there. So we are planning to work with our drainage group. We've already had preliminary discussions about where the drain comes from, the lake that's within the casino corridor. We have had some um, conversations with some of the professors from Queens College, and we are going to be creating a list of potential strategies um, that we can use in that area, and we will be working working together to bring to the both green and gray um, opportunities that exist there. Yeah. Thank you. So it was over there the last time they did major, uh, so it was a, a long, long time ago. No. So the, the, we probably need another upgrade on, on that uh, uh, on the drainage system in that area. And, and as Deputy uh, Commissioner Lakata mentioned, we, we will have that as part of the assessment, Chair Codice. You know, if uh, it, normal uh, you know hard pipe drainage improvements can help, or or if other things are needed, and you know we'll we'll report back on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my next question is to, uh, to the parks. Um, the pay fair campaign secure funding in fiscal year 2022 to invest in nature and facilities. How is the parks planning on using this funding to make parks properties more resilient? Uh, thank you for your question, Chair, Fu, Chair Ku, and I want to thank you and the Council for providing that funding for the through the Playfair Initiative for the Forest Management Framework. Uh, we have a plan to, uh, to maintain and improve natural areas in 26 of our parks around the city. It's quite extensive. The goal is to uh, keep those natural areas as healthy as possible, restore features that may have become degraded over time, uh, provide better access through trail maintenance and trail restoration and building new trails and introducing more volunteers uh, into our natural areas program. We have over uh, 11,000 acres of natural areas. They contribute enormously uh, to the environmental health of the city by managing stormwater, of course, is one of their key features. Uh, by, by maintaining them better, by expanding the natural features, and by introducing more people to them, we know that those values are only going to increase over time. Uh, so it's a really important investment and one that we're, we're really thrilled to, uh, that the council saw fit to provide. Thank you, Commissioner. So what is the status of Green Streets program? How many have been built in recent years? Well, council member, the, uh, the Green Streets program started uh, almost 25 years ago under then Commissioner Stern, uh, who was a driving force behind it. Uh, we officially ended the Green Streets program in 2010 uh, and began transitioning towards a green infrastructure approach uh, to both managing parkland and managing environmental impacts on parks. So we don't have a, a program to build new green streets uh, as a regular basis. We do, however, uh, we can, however, and do uh, build new green streets when funding is provided to us. So, you know, for example, we received a grant after Hurricane Sandy uh, to build a series of connected green streets 
on Guider Avenue in Brighton Beach in, in Brooklyn. Uh, they just finished uh, not, not too long ago. Similarly, we had funding to install some green streets uh, in the Wakefield section of the Bronx at Nareed Avenue and Richardson Avenue. So it, when there are opportunities, both in terms of a site that's suitable uh, to become a green street, because we did plant, uh, we did create 2,214 green streets citywide. So we, we took advantage of the most obvious properties already, but if there are sites and, and a, either a funding source through a grant, a foundation or an elected official, we can certainly add more green streets, but we don't do it in the normal course of business as we were when the program was most active. So uh, what is the process for installing green streets? Can community, community members request one be installed in a particular location? They can certainly suggest a location and we will evaluate it to see if it's suitable, uh, if it meets the criteria of the program and uh, it's a feasible project. Uh, but then we would ask uh, that the sponsor help find the resources needed to build the Green Street. We don't have a, an allocation within our capital budget to build new Green Streets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Commissioner at the DEP. Uh, you, both agencies have been doing good work for our city. No, thank you. So, uh, Chair uh, Janelle, I finished my questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Chair Ku, for for your questions and for the bills that you have on on the on the docket today. And I will defer to the committee council if you can let me know the next person uh, uh, in turn who was asked to be recognized for questioning. Sure. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. Uh I believe there are other uh, council members who have questions. I'll just quickly say um, members who have questions for any of the panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function and please raise your hand now. If you right, what, 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 I, 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 I know that uh, uh, Councilman Brooks Powers and Councilmember Holden yes. both have their hands and I just don't know which yes. one came first. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Holden had first raised his question followed by Councilmember Brooks Powers. And again, there'll be a five minute time limit for council members. Um, and Councilmember Holden again is the first. Starting time. Uh, thank you. I, I, I thank you. Thank you. I, I, I uh, recognize Councilmember Holden. Thank you. Thank you, uh, chairs. Thank, thank all the chairs, by the way. Very good hearing and uh, very important information. I just want to uh, welcome Commissioner Sapienza. Thank you again for your testimony. And I just have some, uh, one real question regarding intro 67 in relation to placing liability on the city for overtax sewer lines and requiring the city to develop a plan to mitigate and prevent sewer backups. Uh, the bill mentions, among other things, we talked, you mentioned it before, our backwater valves, or I call them check valves, um, where the homeowners certainly have a backup caused by an insufficient New York City sewer system that backs up and sometimes, you know, could be raw sewage several times into their homes. And I, I know that uh, I've had that once happen to me. Um, it was really not the city's fault years ago. It was like, you have to obviously maintain your sewer line and you, sh you should get maintenance on it um, every year, I guess, uh, clean it out, make sure it's uh, working sufficiently. Um, but there's nothing worse than raw sewage backing up into your home. I guess you would agree, uh, Commissioner. Um, ha happened to me as well. Yeah. Right. Right. So, well, it, so if you can think about, and I think I think DEP can can kind of address this because if it's not the homeowner's fault, and because they just happen to live in an area where the city didn't really think about, um, you know, upgrading because of maybe overdevelopment, and there's a lot of reasons why we kind of don't have a um, a sufficient sewer system for that particular area. Will you think about, I and mean, I know you said you're gonna look at this, this bill, but you think about either rebates or credit off their water and sewer taxes to, or you know, to help them install a check valve. What, what, and, by, and by the way, what is it, you, you know what it would cost to install a typical check valve on a, on a let's say a single family home? 
this all we'll, we'll start with that uh council member holden so the, the the device themselves the check valve is only a few hundred dollars but then you know whatever the plumber finds uh, as the configuration in the basement um it's going to add labor to that but uh you know that, that that's where that is but you know, I guess with, with the, the legislation, you know, one of the things that we just have have some trouble with is, you know, as we heard earlier, the, the sewers are designed for a five year rainstorm. So if a six year rainstorm comes and uh, the system backs up into a basement, um, you know, that's just the way that the, the system was designed. It doesn't mean that there was anything functionally wrong uh, with the sewers, that it was dirty or, or, or anything else. So, you know, you know, we agree that that sewer backups are are an issue. Uh, I think we've done a good job. Again, we, in the testimony, we mentioned uh, seventy percent reduction in the last decade. Uh, still a lot to do, but you know, we certainly would like to to craft uh, legislation that um, you know protects homeowners, but also uh, people who pay water bills who would ultimately be liable uh, if, if there are damages. So we want to strike that right balance. But but if if it's happened a number of times to individuals. Because like I just you know this one in five years, you know obviously I don't know if the city will 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 you know will determine whether that could be feasible. But if it's happening regularly in certain areas of the city, then I think obviously the city should look at upgrading the sewer system long term, and we know how long that could take. But certainly to counsel the, the homeowners, um, work with them offer some plan for possible rebate of a check valve because I mean there's there's a few different check valves I understand there's there's ones that you know that you could manually close the gate right that will you can't use your obviously your toilets or your sinks but you could at least prevent the backup in in the height of the storm or some other reason why it's backing up but I think if people just happen to live in a very you know a, a prone area for backups then I think we have to help them. And I think you would agree to that. Uh, that because if, if I'm not saying again, the one in five year thing, I'm talking about where they have regularly yearly backups from the city sewer system. Now we, we you know, certainly understand the issue council member that, that you've raised. And, uh, you know, again, we, we've, I think we've been focusing that I talked about the 70% reduction in sewer backups in the last 10 years. We focused a lot on those recurring locations, you know, blocks where we see every couple of years the issue, uh, you know, but there's certainly more to do. And again, you know, happy to continue working with the council to find out what the, uh, you know, best but, path. And just one, one last question. Didn't the uh, city uh, partner with insurance companies or they, they kind of said, you know, if you have pipe. Time expired. When you have pipe, uh, can I finish, uh, Chair? Uh, uh, yes, I will let the uh, uh, council member yeah, hold and uh, finish this question. Yeah, one last question. Where the city partnered with insurance companies and they said, you know, if you want to pipe insurance or this insurance, couldn't we do something where um, we partnered with uh, some, uh, you know, uh, an organization that could install these for a discounted price um, and uh, work on that uh, option possibly uh, for people that were homeowners who need that because we are paying water and sewer. And if a sewer is not working, something needs to happen here. And, and then really on the city's part. No, that's a suggestion we could certainly look at. And yet, yes, we have um, partnered with a company, American Water Resources, that, that can you can purchase insurance for both your sewer line and your your, your water service. But uh, no, it's a good suggestion. And we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on that. All right. Thank uh, you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, uh, thank you, Council Member Holden, for that uh, interesting uh, attack that we may be able to uh, um, employ to get this building on. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being patient and uh, uh, giving us the benefit of your good question. And with that, I recognize Councilmember Brooks Powers. Starting time. Thank you so much, Chair Gennaro, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, thank you again, Chair Gennaro, Chair Ku, and um, Chair Brannon for convening this hearing. Um, we have urgent concerns for our safety of our communities. Climate change isn't happening in 10 years, it's happening now, as we all know. And as 
The committee's own report acknowledges Southeast Queens has experienced a longstanding flooding problem for many years. And my district includes the Eastern Rockaways and neighborhoods like Rosedale and Springfield Gardens, which all sit close to the shore of Jamaica Bay. And these areas submit more flooding and sewage backup reports than any other area in the city. In fact, I spoke to a constituent just yesterday um, with um, Commissioner Sapienza with me in the district who I thank for coming out to the 31st district to meet with my constituents, where she shared that um, as she was preparing um, to give birth, her doctor told her if she went into labor, it would be a search and rescue mission to get her out in the event that there was rain because the waters reached so high in that residential area. Um, I wanted to, to just give that example um, just to kind of give a picture to folks in terms of when we say we have flooding concerns. In that light, I'd like to ask the administration a few questions. There are projects in my district and other areas that are most threatened by flooding that will not start for three years. And even once it starts, it'll take about three years to complete. So in essence, we'll be waiting at least six years for the benefits of these projects to come to our communities. Can the city commit to moving up the timeline for these projects? DEP and the Office of Climate Resiliency ran a 2016 pilot in Southeast Queens examining how the new green infrastructure could handle extreme rainfall and cloudburst conditions. I know that Director Bavishi at the Office of Climate Resiliency expressed enthusiasm um, for expanding this program at last month's joint hearing with um, transportation, environment, and resiliency. What were the results of this pilot? And does the city have plans to expand the program in the near future? Um, and I yield for the response to those questions. Thank you so much. Councilwoman, I'll start and then uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to MOCR. But um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you and I have done walking tours a few times now and you know, certainly picture paints more than a thousand words. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of sad uh, situations. You know, we spoke about the, the mayor's commitment to building storm sewers uh, in Southeast Queens and, and helping out parts of Rockaway as well. Uh, that work is underway. Uh, we, we all wish it could go faster. But, you know, the, the areas that you pointed out to us that are really, you know, more than just, you know, people walking with their ankles in water where it's life and safety issues. We will work with the Department of Design and Construction to see if we can expedite some of those projects because, you know, it's clear, particularly uh, the one area we were in in Minton Street yesterday where, where it gets very bad. So, uh, you know, we, we, we will try to expedite that. Um, I'll turn it over now to Director Bavishi. Thanks, Council Member, for the questions. Um, yes, uh, we have been implementing um, the pilot in uh, Jamaica Houses in St. Albans. Um, uh, the, the pilot is moving along. Um, uh, we're moving into construction quite soon. Um, and in the new normal report that the mayor released last month, we made a commitment to exp expand Cloudburst initiatives citywide. Um, our first step is to create a framework um, to determine where we'll implement these cloudburst initiatives. Um, we wanna make sure that we're taking into account physical indicators of risk as well as social indicators of risk so that we're implementing in an equitable and transparent way. Um, and we will be investing in uh, four projects immediately. Um, that funding will uh, appear in the capital budget that will come out very soon. Um, and we'll be seeking state and federal funding to implement more beyond those first four. Thank you both for your responses and um, your partnership on this very important issue. Um, and Commissioner Sapienza definitely um, hope that we can see um, a more accelerated timeline for the construction. Um, and I trust that it will be conveyed to um, the mayor in terms of how um, the safety dynamics are presented in communities like mine um, I'm expired. so that we can be able to to really move this forward. So thank you so much to both of you for your responses. And and, and, and I wish to thank uh, um, Councilmember Brooke Powers for um, um, elevating this. And I promise you, Councilmember Brooke Powers, that uh, 
we'll talk about this in the next budget. And um, you know, my 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 staff is already taking note of the uh, um, imperative that this happens. So thank you very much for elevating it at this hearing. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I will once again uh, defer to the committee council, but I see council member Rose as, uh, is uh, seeking to ask questions. Yes, council member Rose does have a question. Okay, I, uh, I happily recognize council member Rose. Starting time. Thank you so much, chair. Um, my, my colleagues uh, pretty much asked the questions that I had in mind, I too, um, I'm very concerned about the blueprint titled The New Normal, Combating Storm-Related Extreme Weather in New York City and, and the timeline. You know, um, we know that there's gonna, there are, there are long-term projects, but I was wondering if they saw any number of capital or infrastructure um, projects that could take place immediately and done quickly um, to get um, some improvement and um, and my question is really uh, Staten Island based in terms of uh, the the blue belt. Last fall, the expansion of the Mid Island Blue Belt began its plans to reduce flooding. Uh, I'd like to know how many of these projects have been completed so far, and how many more remain um, undone uh, from this expansion. And um, and I'm particularly concerned about the Snug Harbor. Um, blue belt, uh, which would help mitigate um, many of our flooding and water um, problem, you know, water, uh, yeah, water problems. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rose, thanks for, uh, for, for all those, uh, raising all, all those issues. Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, so, so first, you know, question was just about how long these projects take and some of the, the again, larger, uh, more infrastructure intensive projects do take a long time. And so I think that's why we want to sort of pivot again, as we look at hybrid approaches, things that we can get uh, done more quickly, like green infrastructure, permeable pavement. If we could do those types of things uh, in, in a shorter timeline, um, you know, we certainly want to do. Um, talking about the blue belts, I mean, those have been a great success story for Staten Island um, to date. Much of it has been focused on the South Shore. Uh, we've been doing more Mid-Island now. And again, great successes there. We want to continue to do more. Uh, but you mentioned the, the Snug Harbor Blue Belt and uh, you know, the mayor and, and visited Rumsey Hospital. I went with him, which, which suffered a lot of flooding. The right. Snug, Island, Snug uh, Harbor you know, Blue Belt would certainly help to address that. And we've actually put uh, some, some additional funding forward for that project to get that uh, that restarted because um, you know that the more North Shore area certainly could could benefit from that as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Do we have a, a time a time frame for that? Is it in this fiscal year? Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, you know, again, the money money was allocated. It's it. You will see it. Uh, I guess tomorrow when the the new capital plan comes out. But um, I I think it's a few years out still, and some of the design still needs to be done. Um, that that's that was um, why I started my question with you know some long term and short term. Um, this to me seems to be a, a a good fix, a fix that would would address um, many of the major issues of flooding, especially on the North Shore. Um, I, I don't quite understand why we're not putting the capital funds in you know, immediately since we really, we see that we don't have time. We, we really don't have time. Uh, this, the last occurrence wasn't an anomaly anymore. It, it's gonna be like almost our new normal. So um, I, I really would like to sit down and, and talk to, to the administration about how we sort of put this on speed dial because this was a project that had been green lighted, and um, and I, I don't really understand why you know we um, for some reason it was taken um, yeah. off the books. Yeah, and, and and a great example, Councilmember, you'll know on Staten Island where we do have, you know, the the bulk of the blue belts completed along the uh, the South Shore, they they did pretty well during Ida compared to 
you know, more of the North Shore uh, that got hit really hard. And, um, you know, we, we, we want to, again, get this project moving. Okay, I just want to make it a priority because, you know, um, um, the North Shore uh, hasn't been a priority in terms of, of these resiliency projects, of storm surge. Uh, it's almost as if we haven't suffered um, some of the same incidents uh, at even the same level sometimes as, you know, Mid Island and South Shore. So um, I, I want to see it. it I, I would like to see these projects become a priority. Thank uh, you. I, 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 uh, um, Council Member Rose, I, I, uh, I mean, uh, you just to kind of put my two cents in here, I mean, you know, we could always pursue the nuclear option of a you know, budget modification. Um, I mean, you know, that, that really would be the nuclear option, but if that's something, you know, you want to pursue with the council leadership, I mean, that may be a door you could open, you know. Thank you so much, Chair Gennaro. Um, and, and I will, um, I'll, I'll have an offline conversation with you um, and the leadership. Thank you so much. That's, Thank, that's you, Council Thank you, Councilman Rowe. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rowe. The moderator, uh, 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 the uh, committee council, is there anyone else wishing to be uh, pose questions to the administration? At this point, count, uh, Chair, there are no other council members with questions. Um, we may go back to you co-chairs, or at this point, we can also turn back, turn to public testimony. Uh, yeah, let me just see if, uh, um, uh, if um, uh, you know, Chair Brannon or Chair Ku have any further questions for the administration. Is, is that the case? Um, uh, if not, we can... Um, uh, I have no more questions. Uh, uh, okay, is is is, is uh, uh, Chair Brannon on? Sometimes people go in and I'm out. On. I'm on, but I'm I'm good. I'm good, Chair. Thank you. Uh, 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 okay, uh, with that, I would really like to thank the administration, uh, you know, very much for their uh, you know very forthcoming and you know sincere and you know substantive um, uh, testimony, and uh, you know just to show that uh, you know j just to show uh, you know Director Babishi. Um, that I take it very seriously in what she said. I've already asked my, you know, legislative council to put in a, uh, you know, legal services, you know, request to do what you mentioned in your testimony. I, so I will, I, 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 uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to do a little more, you know, you know, looking into that. Um, but um, um, we, we are already drafting, uh, you know, legal services request to uh, create what you mentioned. Uh, you know, in terms of the fully funded uh, uh, mayor's office of, of you know climate resiliency, uh, you know if that is indeed if, if that is in, um, indeed needed. So thank you for bringing that forward. I I, I do appreciate that. With everyone else, uh, the administration, I just want to thank everyone uh, who is here on behalf of the administration. And uh, so, um, but someone will be staying behind in order to be on the. Uh, um, presumably someone from the mayor's office will you know, continue to monitor this hearing and hear all of the good testimony from the public. If that person from the mayor's office can uh, identify uh, herself or himself as to who will be staying on to listen to the good testimony from the public, do we, like, do we have that person? Yes, someone from the mayor's office will be staying on and um, will listen to the testimony. They'll be on the live stream. Great, great. I, I, I thank you very much, uh, Director Babishi and everyone else. So, with that said, the uh, uh, we'll uh, you know move on to public testimony, and uh, I thank once again, finally, uh, the commission, uh, the uh, everyone from the administration for the good testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, um, I, I will tell the uh, speakers that, that we're about to hear from, uh, you know, this is a list that is held by the committee council. Um, I, I don't know who's coming next, so it's going to be, you know, kind of a surprise. I don't control it, but um, uh, I look forward to hearing uh, the testimony and all the members who will stay on this hearing. Look forward to hearing the uh, um, testimony of each and every uh, witness who wishes to come forward. 
And uh, with that committee council, uh, who is our next witness? Uh, thank you, Chair Gennaro. Our, our next witness is Donovan Finn, by, followed by Tyler Taba. And if I could just uh, briefly uh, introduce the, this next segment. Um, unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Yep. Each panelist will be given uh, three minutes to speak. Uh, so each panelist, please identify yourself at any organization you represent and the sergeant will give you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panis, panelist should feel free to use the raise hand function in Zoom, and you'll then be called after the panelist has completed uh, their testimony. So as, as I mentioned before, our first panelist is Donovan Finn, followed by Tyler Taba. Starting time. Hello, thank you. My name is Donovan Finn. I'm an assistant professor of environmental design policy and planning in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University, and I'm a proud resident of Jackson Heights, Queens. I study societal risk from climate change, and I analyze how cities are adapting to those changes. So let me first applaud the council uh, and all the city agencies for their resiliency efforts, which I can say with certainty are both progressive and enormously important right now. Uh, but the takeaway from our research at Stony Brook is simple. As events like Sandy and Ida have illustrated and others have mentioned today, the effects of human caused climate change uh, is not imminent, it arrived yesterday. And only aggressive action is going to protect us from this grim future of our own making. Stormwater flooding, topic of today is a textbook example. Uh, the most sophisticated climate science like that done by my colleagues at Stony Brook tells us that our future will be wetter and our weather more extreme. But we can't build resilience with just concrete and pipes. Uh, we must remake our urban system and remake our concrete jungle as a green sponge that absorbs stormwater, harnesses natural systems as a way to solve intertwined environmental, economic, and social equity challenges. And this is going to require, I think, rethinking our entire system of planning and governance. From parks, to transportation, education, economic development, and environmental justice. Uh, luckily, many other cities are leading the way on this as well. The underground parking garage in the Dutch city of Rotterdam that I visited a couple of years ago that holds 3 million gallons of stormwater. Uh, the three new resiliency parks across the river in Hoboken that have turned three toxic brownfields into recreational space as well as 2 million gallons of storage space. Um, but the effective solutions have to be locally tailored. Here in New York, I think our most abundant resources are 6,000 miles of streets that comprise 27% of our land area. So rethinking those streets as the, the kidneys of the city would sequester stormwater, make walking and bicycling safer, and improve public health, mental health, and mm -hmm. social equity. Uh, the connected benefits are endless, but despite all of the efforts the city is already doing in this area, my key message is that we cannot let a single opportunity pass by with every dime the city spends on any capital project starting today, resilience really has to be the first concern. Every single missed opportunity will haunt us in the decades to come. Uh, in closing, I would also mention that these are the kind of transformative environmental, economic, and social solutions that the city and universities like Stony Brook are envisioning for a new Center for Climate Solutions on Governor's Island. Leveraging the city's expertise and workforce can help us develop uh, and implement such solutions throughout this region and globally and become a global leader for climate solutions. Yes, these challenges are daunting, but effective solutions, while expensive and sometimes politically viable, vo volatile, excuse me, uh, are critically important. The council and agencies have made laudable progress, but we must continue to use the best science and policies to accelerate these efforts. Thank you for your time and attention to this important topic. Thank you very much. And we'll turn to uh, Chair Gennaro, who has a question or comment. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Finn. As you uh, well know, I'm very familiar with the good folks of the, uh, of the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, uh, uh, you may or may not know that uh, um, Stony Brook is my undergraduate and graduate um, alma mater. <clears throat> uh, uh, we, I, I have my um, legislative director, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nabi Kaur, who is uh, watching this, uh, you know, uh, 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 broadcast. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, um, offline have a conversation. Uh, you know, with you uh, to get the benefit of, uh, you know, your brainwaves on, on this very critical issue, those and those of your colleagues, you know, because there's the work that you've done, there's the people that you represent also at um, um, SOMAS, 
And um, I'm very mindful of, uh, you know, Stony Brook's interest in the, uh, you know, Governor's Island, uh, you know, Climate Center. I'm very grateful that, you know, uh, Stony Brook with the resources that it has and those that it has at its disposal uh, with its, uh, you know, relationship with, uh, you know, Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, that, um, you know, you would be able to make very good things happen. Uh, at that center, although that's not my call, but what is my call is the ability to sort of get together with you and get the benefit of your views, which will, you know, inform my committee and the, uh, you know, other committees that are, you know, represented today. So I, I uh, thank you very much and I look forward to an ongoing relationship and I thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you. Our next panelist is Tyler Taba, followed by Carlos Castel Croak. Starting time. Thank you. My name is Tyler Taba. I'm a fellow at the Waterfront Alliance, the leader in waterfront revitalization, climate resilience, and advocacy for the New York, New Jersey Harbor region. This oversight hearing is very timely, and we would like to express uh, support for the full package of bills being reviewed today. Recent storms in 2021 alone have claimed lives, wrought damage to infrastructure, flooded homes and apartments, and shut down mass transit. Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition recently shared a how-to guide for the next mayor, which proposed immediate actions for the first 100 days of the incoming administration. In this guide, we detail recommendations for all three overarching topics of this hearing, green infrastructure, urban flooding, and sewer infrastructure. We'd like to give special attention to two of the bills from today's hearing. Intro 1618 and T-2021-8002. These two bills highlight lessons learned over the five years of implementing Waterfront Alliance's Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, also known as WEDGE, for coastal projects. The Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines are a powerful tool for communities and landowners to build resilience into projects. While designed for the waterfront, many of these guidelines easily adapt to properties across the city. Several wedge credits used for scoring projects are relevant to green infrastructure, urban flooding, and sewer overflows. Credits 4.9, 4.10, and 4.11, for example, are focused on reducing stormwater quantity, improving stormwater discharge quality, and reducing combined sewer overflows, respectively. Credits in wedge also reward designs that use green infrastructure to manage additional stormwater runoff expected with increased and more intense precipitation events. These guidelines offer a blueprint for resilience solutions that can be easily applied to all areas of New York City, and we recommend they be integrated into the Intro 1618 study. We also support T2021-8002. It is imperative for homeowners to be equipped with tools that assist with retrofits. Financial assistance for backwater valves is an excellent start. We would like to emphasize the need to properly fund and support widespread communications regarding this bill. The financial assistance for purchase and installation of backwater valves should be communicated extensively so that individuals are able to take advantage of such incentives. The vulnerability in our city's infrastructure has been on full display over the past several years. The development of policies like the ones we're hearing about today are a testament to the actions we must take to protect our residents and our infrastructure. We're grateful for the council for continuing to act on climate change and resilience, and it's time to put these policies, these values, excuse me, into policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Chair Gennaro. Okay. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, uh, am I, am I, am you're I? You're good now, Chair. I can hear you okay, now. yeah. I, 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 I just want to, it says I'm muted again. Am I muted again? No, you're, you're good. I can okay. hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I, 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 I just want to thank Tyler very much. I mean, I go back with the Waterfront Alliance a long time, you know, you know, back to the Roland Lewis days and uh, worked on, you know, many collaborations with him, you know, with regard to the um, Jamaica Bay um, uh, 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 um, watershed management plan and uh, everything we did to transfer, uh, uh, you know, wetlands, which were owned by other city agencies to permanent protection uh, by the Parks Department. And so, you know, long history with the, uh, you know, Waterfront Alliance, and I'm very grateful that you uh, were patient enough to give us the benefit of your views, which will not be lost on the three committees listening to them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. You bet. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Castel Croak, followed by Michael Dulong. Starting time. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'd like to thank Chairs Gerenaro, Ku, and Brandon for the opportunity to testify today. In the wake of Hurricane Ida and other recent storms, New Yorkers have once again had to confront the extreme weather that climate change will continue to bring. One resiliency issue that is heavily affected by these storms is that of combined sewage overflows, or CSOs. New York City's old and outdated sewage system can be overwhelmed by just a tenth of an inch of rain over one hour, resulting in sewage and dirty stormwater runoff being dumped into our local waterways. These CSOs dump 27 billion gallons of raw sewage and polluted water into the New York Harbor each year. Thankfully, the city acknowledges the issue of CSOs. The DEP implemented the Green Infrastructure Program to directly target this issue in accordance with consent orders with the state. However, even when the plan is completed in 2030, it will not sufficiently prevent CSOs. To protect our city and our waterways from increasing amounts of stormwater runoff and flooding, we need to work across multiple agencies, not just DEP, to build our robust system of resilient green and gray infrastructure. One way we can do this is by completely reimagining our streetscape. We need to be reprioritizing streets away from cars and towards pedestrianized plazas, uh, micromobility, and public forms of transportation, safe recreational space for New Yorkers, and much more green infrastructure to absorb stormwater, purify our air, and mitigate the urban heat island effect. Transportation Alternatives 25 by 25 plan lays out how we can reclaim 25% of our street space and repurpose it for all of these local benefits. As green infrastructure and streetscape planned already exist in 1NYC and through DEP's ongoing work, we should be building upon the work already underway to make sure that we advance more ambitious goals in a coordinated and streamlined manner. We can also be implementing green infrastructure in our buildings with green roofs. The Parks Department already maintains over 20,000 square feet of green roofs across New York City, which provide insulation and absorb rainwater. However, this only covers a fraction of the 40,000 acres of rooftop space available in our city. We must be utilizing as many buildings as possible for green roofs to absorb rainwater and reduce our sewer overload. Building upon our green infrastructure plans, we must be giving special attention to our trees, parks, and urban forests. The trees on our streets and in our parks are some of the most valuable green assets, keeping us cool, cleaning our air, and fighting flooding. Expanding our urban forests is a top priority for the Forest for All NYC Coalition, of which NYLCV is a member. And with them, we will fight to increase New York City's canopy cover to 30% by 2035. Our parks are equally as important as our urban forests, absorbing over 2 billion gallons of stormwater runoff each year. Properly funding and maintaining our parks, expanding porous and permeable infrastructure in playgrounds, and equitably building our more parks in environmental justice areas that severely lack green spaces should all be priorities for the city as we progress towards a resilient future. Thank you. Thank you. And Council uh, Chair Gennaro does have a question or comment. Uh, um, thank you, Carlos. I wish to uh, thank the League Conservation Voters for their uh, you know, ongoing and amazing work, uh, particularly on uh, on uh, CSOs. And if I could ask something uh, of you, uh, you know, the president uh, of um, um, LCB, uh, Julie Tai, you know, who came from the DEC as chief of staff, has um, you know has, has you know in depth knowledge about how DEP is performing with regard to consent orders. Um, that the DEC has um, uh, with the uh, DEP. Uh, the um, commissioner uh, indicated, uh, you know, truthfully that the, uh, uh, that, you know, DEP is trying very hard. Um, but um, if I could ask, uh, you know, the, the league, you know, through um, interaction with Julie and through her contacts with, with uh, you know, DEC, <clears throat> To kind of um, you know provide to uh, uh, you know provide to the council like you know LCV's own scorecard you know so to speak of you know DEP's CSO compliance. It, it's one thing to hear from DEP how they're doing. It's another thing to hear from an organization like yours that has you know real access to the people at DEC as to um, you know how uh, how DEP is doing with regard to you know CSO. Uh, you know, consent order compliance. If you'd be willing to provide that to us, I think that would be helpful to us. Would you I, be willing think, to do that? I think something like that is a great idea, and I'd, I'd love to talk more with your office. I know that uh, Riverkeeper is also interested in this issue and be 
um, interest in working with us on something like that. But we can follow. Or, we can definitely we, do some. We can definitely work on some kind of report like that. I think that'd be okay. great. Okay, and, and if you could follow up with my um, legislative uh, director, Nabi Cower, who I think you know. Absolutely. Um, then so if you could you know connect with her, then that'd be great. So. Thank you for uh, having the patience to give us the benefit of your good views and say hi to Julie for us. Okay. I'll do. Thank you, council member. Okay. You bet. Thank you. Next up is Michael DeLong followed by Paul Mankiewicz. Starting time. Thank you, chairpersons. And thank you, Carlos, for volunteering us for that work. Um, my name is Michael DeLong. I'm a senior attorney with Hudson Riverkeeper. I am also on the steering committee of the SWIM Coalition and on the boards of Newtown Creek Alliance and Guardians of Flushing Bay. Um, I'll get right to it. Planning for climate change is paramount. Thank you for passing intro 1620 to require a climate adaptation plan. These types of plans and studies and the studies that are at issue today are important for the city and case in point, the stormwater resiliency plan and mapping that was required by this council in 2018 uh, would have been useful to have a long time before that because it showed places in Ida that flooded, places in Ida are places where people tragically passed away. Um, and with that information, the city council can act to prevent things like that. So the city should never be caught off guard. Now, the city's sewer system has a number of capacity issues. One of them is combined sewer overflows when it rains as little as a tenth of an inch. Um, we see polluted stormwater and sanitary sewage overflow into the city's waterways. The city's plans to address this, the, the long-term control plans, um, I would give the plans themselves an F. First of all, they do not account for climate change. And I'll say that again, the city's plans for sewage and storm sewer overflows do not account for climate change. Um, and I just, I want to highlight two studies uh, that would be required under 1618 that would go a long way to addressing this. Um, when Chairperson Ku asked the commissioner, Commissioner Sapienza, um, what he thought about these strategies, I think his, his answer was to say that some of the information would be incorporated into things that DEP already reports. That is true, but that leaves out the, the benefit of this council having that information compiled for studies that are readable by the public and by the council. It also leaves out information, important information, such as or studies that don't exist, that the city has not produced for the state, uh, such as the integrated watershed management planning, uh, whereas the CSOs look at, or the LTCPs look at CSO only, the city's combined sewer overflow. Uh, these integrated plans would go a long way to protecting our waters because they look at separate sewer overflow, they look at direct drain off, um, drainage, they look at other pollutants coming to these waterways, so they look at it in a holistic way to deal with the problem, not just at that one CSO problem. The other thing that it would require would be an assessment or a, a green infrastructure opportunity inventory to look at every place in New York City where private and public where green infrastructure would be feasible. Um, that would give the city a roadmap to resiliency, a roadmap to achieving the, the city as a sponge dream. Um, DEP staff Time would expired. Be, can I just comment on the, the green infrastructure program? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 um, I will give uh, Mr. You know, DeLong at least another you know, 30 seconds to finish his thought. Thank you. DEC, DEP staff are doing fantastic on the green infrastructure program to implement it, but they are not in compliance with the consent order. They are not doing enough. They need reinforcements in terms of funding, staff, and buy-in from other agencies. Um, and I'll leave it there, but a plan and more investment in green infrastructure is critical. Thank you. Thank you. And back to Chair Gennaro. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to thank Mr. DeLong and his, you know, great organization with whom I have a very, very long relationship going back to, you know, the earliest days of Riverkeeper. Um, and, uh, for, uh, and and uh, it seems like, you know, you and, uh, you know, the league are going to, you know, partner on that, you know, scorecard regarding, uh, you know, CSO compliance. You know, your testimony went into more um you know more like um arcane you know areas that need more daylight and i uh you know would direct you to work with my legislative uh council 
uh, you know, uh, Nabi Kaur, uh, you know, uh, and, and you know, she will, uh, you know, loop in, uh, and we want to also loop in, um, you know, Chair Brannon because you know he is, after all, in charge of resiliency, um, and we look forward to working with you. Just sort of tie this off with uh, uh, Nabi, make sure she has all the benefit, you know, all the. You know, I, I, we, you know, we want to do a deep dive into your, uh, um, into your testimony. If you could provide her with that information, I'd appreciate that. Will do. I have a full written testimony submitted, and I look forward to working with you and the league on, on this issue. Thank you. Yes, and let me comment on the fact that you're wearing a jacket and I'm not. And so, like, you like, one up on me. So, um, good for you. And so... Uh, I'm going to uh, and I don't. Okay, okay. Touche. Okay, like, we're even. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Council, who is our next witness? Our next speaker is Paul Mankiewicz, followed by Joseph Charup. Um, that, uh, uh, um, that would be Dr. Paul Mankiewicz, who I know forever and ever. <laughs> and I look forward to his testimony. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Chair Brandon. Thank you, uh, Chair Liu. Uh, exceedingly good to find you, to, find to see you, uh, uh, Chair Chair General. Uh, I'm Paul Mankwitz. I have run the Gaia Institute for some decades here. I'm the chair of the Soil and Water Conservation District, a co-founder of the Urban Soil Institute in New York City, and also a, a co-founder of a new green infrastructure business based on a lot of the work I've done uh, called Leaf Island. I'm going to talk just physics. I'd like to see this problem solved sooner as opposed to later, uh, Jim, and you would as well. Uh, the problem, of course, is the volume of water and where do you put it in the city of New York? So the right at this very minute, uh, our de deputy commissioner from DEP is, of course, well aware of this. And the uh, commissioner, uh, Pinar Bassi, is actually working on something that could be used much, much, much more quickly than building out infrastructure. And that is building aquifers locally, which can then be coupled with green infrastructure. I think I built the first for the city of New York. This is recycled glass aggregate. It's got a 50 percent void space. And Commissioner Pinar is now actually looking to build aquifers. You then have to couple it with green infrastructure because then, let me give you an example, 100 linear feet of sidewalk, five feet wide, six feet deep, because that makes three feet of void space in glass aggregate, can capture something like 11,000 gallons of water. That's three inches of, that's an inch of runoff over three acres or three inches of runoff for an acre. I'm telling you those numbers because those can start to match something like the murderous flows of Ida. So we need aquifers, then they need to be coupled. We need a kind of competition to get green walls because there's thousands of square feet of green wall. Every square, basically they all evaporate something like a six millimeters or a quarter inch a day. So a way to get rid of the water, why do you wanna do that? That same 11,000 gallons of water of apple transpired is worth 340 tons of air conditioning, reversing urban heat islands, cleaning the air, and catching hundreds of pounds of carbon at the same time. I built under the Major Deegan Expressway a pop-up wetland, which is basically pictured Jersey barriers with a swimming pool liner in it, covered with wetland plants, not open water. So basically, these are un compared to digging anything in the ground, as you well know. These are very, very inexpensive. I would like to see, if we catch water, water is the power that runs the biosphere. It controls the climate. The climate in the city in the center of Manhattan in Prospect Park is controlled by the biota. And DEP is on this road as is parks to basically build natural systems into the landscapes where we live and breathe. Every square meter of leaves pulls out a quarter gram of two point, particles 2.5 M every single year. So I'll send my testimony along, uh, Jim, but the point is that we basically need to build this. And this we can do now. We could literally simply excavate under sidewalks, under streets, under parking lots. And the other use, actually, some company could build a parking Time lot expired. and basically also heat or cool their building with the uh, heat they could extract from the ground. Thank you. Uh, 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 Mr. Council, I'm waiting. Uh, I guess you can recognize me. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, Paul, um, we are long over to do to catch up. You know, it, 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 it's been a long time. Uh, we, you know, uh, you know, we have a long and, you know, storied history and um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm you know, directing my legislative council, you know, to get, 
you know, you and me together face to face. And then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll walk through some of this. And uh, I, I, I hope and trust that uh, Julie is well, Every, everything yeah, she's no, well, good. I, I, you don't see her, but uh, I'm, I'm basically, uh, uh, the daughter is in uh, Yale School of uh, Environment getting a PhD. So and the son is at the Borough, uh, Brooklyn College uh, Academy of Music. So uh, life is great, great. Great, great, great. Okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, Paul and I, you know, like everyone now knows that like Paul and I are friends a long time. And uh, uh, I look forward to getting together and getting uh you're doing, uh, you know, getting more of, 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 of your ideas. And with that said, I'm going to have to leave it there, but we'll, getting, we'll be getting to you soon. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph Charup, followed by Joel Kupferman. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Gennaro, Chair Ku, Chair Brannon, and members of the committees. My name is Joseph Cherup, and I'm the Director of Horticulture at Greenwood Cemetery, a National Historic Landmark in a 478-acre green space in the heart of Brooklyn. As Hurricane Ida may tragically clear, the city's sewer infrastructure is not prepared to handle the rainfall caused by extreme rain events. These rain events will increase the billions of gallons of wastewater already discharged annually into New York City waterways as a result of an overwhelmed combined sewer system. Ida was not an anomaly, but an example of things to come. And such storms combined with the increase in annual rainfall and the city's aging infrastructure will have the greatest impact on the most vulnerable. We at Greenwood applaud the proposed local law from our neighbor council member, Brannon, which would require that the city finally take ownership over its crumbling combined sewer infrastructure and create a coherent plan to remedy the situation. While the public sector must take the lead, private institutions also have a role to play. We believe that as the largest contiguous private landowner in New York City, we have the responsibility to leverage our landscape to lessen the impacts of climate change on our surrounding South Brooklyn community. I'd like to briefly share a stormwater project to which we have applied for funding with the New York State's Green Innovation Grant Program that aligns with the goals of Council Member Brennan's proposed law. Greenwood has requested funds to support the design and implementation of 22,750 square feet of bioretention basins or rain gardens on our grounds as part of an integrated stormwater management system. This project will be one of the largest bioretention projects in New York City. The primary goal here is to reduce our impact on combined sewer overflow events by reducing the volume of stormwater runoff by a whopping 6.8 million gallons annually. By reducing Greenwood's burden on the city sewer system, we are seeking to make an important investment in South Brooklyn's climate resilience. Greenwood is located within a mile and a half of eight federal opportunity zones. This project would help the state achieve its goal of improving the quality of life for those New Yorkers who live in areas of greatest need. The climate crisis is now, and it demands that private institutions join their public counterparts, along with city, state, and federal governments to take immediate action to care for the greater good. We hope that our work sets a model for the city's largest green spaces, which includes cemeteries, parks, and even golf courses. I'd like to personally invite members of this committee to visit Greenwood and see the forward-looking work we're doing to benefit Brooklynites and all of us as we battle the effects of climate change. My contact information is in the printed testimony, and I look forward to welcoming you all to the Greenwood soon. Thank you. Thank you, and back to Chair Gennaro. Uh, yes, uh, 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 thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, um, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Cherub. Uh, 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 Cherub, yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was with my, I, I took my daughter to Greenwood about a year ago, um, in like part of the pandemic and uh, would be very willing to come back, uh, uh, you know, this time with my um, legislative director. So, you know, please invite us and um, we look forward to your, uh, you know, to your uh, hospitality. Oh, great. Thank you. We will do. And then we can, and we, then we can, you know, uh, then we can go to other large landowners and shame them. So, um, um, shame but the city, yeah, but the city needs some shaming as well. So, um, uh so thank you very much we look we look forward to catching up and i direct uh you know nabby to uh contact mr uh Shirop and uh get that going it's a it's a great it's a great place i look forward to get back to getting back there again so thank you for being here and for your patience thank you very much Beth. thank you next up is joel kupferman followed by rob buchanan starting time Hello. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Gennaro. I just want to note that I'm a Stony Brook graduate myself. <laughs> uh, 
and we go back uh, a ways and we up Mr. Charrett's um, invite. I've been working at several NYCHA properties now fighting FEMA funded construction that has actually caused a lot of tree destruction and soil compaction. Um, and we offer you an invite to look at all the NYCHA properties to put all these principles and projects that you're talking about. We could convert the NYCHA properties from trees going down and Baruch houses, they just knocked down two, 300 trees um, not more than a year ago. So we've, um, we think this is one of the primary um, resources that the city has neglected. And um, we believe that NYCHA um, is willing to listen to the city and use these, these sites as a, as a major site, a major project. Right now, a lot of the construction that's happening at Smith under the eyes of the federal and the state and the city is reflected elsewhere with this unfettered construction going on. And it looks good that there's a stormwater management plan that seems to be expanded, but in many, many sites, it's the construction that's actually leading to, to soil compaction and, and, and tree destruction. So I think it's really important that we, we um, that work together. The city did um, offer their resources. The city parks came in and we noticed that a lot of the trees are, you know, um, have been hurt by construction. And we want to expand that, that, that program. The other part is that we also want to take, you said taking the city to task. The city, in my experience with all these years is that these, these hearings are really, really good, but we don't enforce it, okay? That's you know, where, the, where the metal comes to the, um, the rubber comes to the, to the metal. Um, case in point, Coney Island Creek, we're building a ferry terminal, um, taking away parkland, taking away resilient green infrastructure that's there and putting in, in, in um, concrete, solid stuff. Why is the parks allowing this to happen? Um, we don't know. Um, and we really think that all projects going forward, that all these principles that you're talking about today, Mr. Gennaro, should be instituted. We find that when, when community groups that we've represented fighting projects, um, when we bring a lawsuit, the city law department steps in and doesn't seem to be listening to your hearings you know, and, and, and policies and always sides on the side of the developer saying no impact. Um, and now I think you know, with the, with, with the changes and all the science that's come out, I think it's really important that the city take more of a, of a, of a more of active role. And I think part of the problem is enforcement. Um, the city um, the, two years ago was owed a billion and a half in uncollected fines um, from developers. Entertain any questions? Um, back to Chair Gennaro. Um, uh, yeah, Joel. Yeah, we do go back a long way, and and, and uh, um, uh, I'm the you know chair of this committee. I'm, I'm not the chair of resiliency. I'm not the chair of parks. I'm not the chair of economic development. I'm not the chair of uh, you know the buildings committee. Um, but uh, so you know the city has to do a lot of things. It it it, it has to build. I get it. We got to build smart. We got to build green. Um, but you know, uh, you know, development has to proceed. Uh, but also, we have to do it smarter, and we have to take you know other opportunities that we can, like you're saying, in parks and with NYCHA, make sure they do that. Um, if you could lay this all out to my uh, you know legislative council, uh, we'd love to have uh, uh, you know a you know dialogue with you uh, about how we can um, uh, you know do it. You know, you know, do what I can from my perch and to, uh, you know, share your good views with other people in the council. Now, in terms of getting the administration to, to comply, I'm the first one to say of all the 50 plus environmental bills, uh, you know, that I've passed, like the city has really lived up to, you know, some of them, but like not all of them. So I know what it's like to do this stuff and, you know, have the executive branch not follow through. And, uh, and you know, I get that. And it's frustrating. But I want you to follow up with my legislative council, and then we'll be in further touch. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. And just one more thing: we should definitely look, reopen the use of the bad actor policy. That the city should not be rewarding contracts to bad. Uh, I, okay, yeah, but I mean, once we, yeah, I, I don't want people to get into the habit once their time is elapsed to sneak that in. But you know, you did, and we know each other a long time, so it's okay. All right. So, Joel, but I got to bounce to the next witness. Okay. Good to see you. 
Thank you. Next, uh, our next speaker is Rob Buchanan, who will be followed by Sean Herschel. Starting time. Is Mr. Buchanan on? Can you hear us? He's on previously. Uh, it, it looks like Mr. Buchanan has left the Zoom, so we'll proceed on to Sean Hirshhorn, who will be followed by Jonathan Mantel. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you all. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, I want to talk about the access to information, I would call it, through the DEP um, site. Uh, I work as a plumber for Goldner Plumbing in the Bronx, servicing five boroughs, and we rely on this information to fill up permits, to access data that allows us to service our clients to the best of our abilities which means timeliness, which means quality and altering this gives us tremendous difficulty blocking this information from filling out permits, from accessing the information needed as to missing meters, as to what meters for what site, as to sizing, as to where it's supposed to be, as well as meter numbers that are oftentimes older rusted over with debris and cannot be read. Uh, it is therefore that I request that access be granted and if it, even perhaps opening more access to be able for plumbers to see it online um, in real time, similar to how property managers can access information or owners on D the DEP accesses. That's my piece. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, 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 thank you. I, I, I was wondering if, if you're if you're testifying in favor of uh, Bill Two One Six Eight. Is that is that what you're sort of getting at here? The whole um, because we have a bill on the docket that talks about uh, you know people getting access to um, you know DEP information. So it'd be fair yes. to say that you're so it's fair to say that you're that you're testifying in favor of Two One Six Eight, right? Yes, I apologize if that was not made clear. At the yeah, okay, I just want to make sure that, um, no, we, 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 we uh, you know, certainly appreciate the benefit of, of, of your views. Uh, you know, I'm listening, uh, um, Council Member Brandon and his staff who are the, you know, who, who are the, uh, you know, it, and he's the lead name on this bill. I'm, I'm sure um, appreciate your good testimony very much. And I thank you for your uh, perseverance and, and, and patience and, and, and being willing to wait to give the benefit of your views. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Mantel, followed by Ezra Schwartz. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, we, like many community advocates, strongly urge the City Council to reinstate our DEP access. Certainly from a transparency and oversight standpoint, having access to the DEP system is essential. We're called upon daily to assist our clients with matters pertaining to their DEP water bills. Because our access has been stripped, we aren't able to assist our clients with essential questions they have to rectify any open balance and to ensure they are properly billed. Furthermore, with regards to setting up payment agreement on any open DEP charges, clients are forced to waive their rights by agreeing to accept the validity of all charges. This is required in order to set up the agreement. The problem again is <clears throat> advocates aren't able to review the validity because our DEP access has been stripped. Property owners who aren't of means could certainly become desperate, borrow money potentially at a premium to pay off their obligation to avoid winding up on the lien sale or worse, lose a multi-generational asset. We certainly hope you will take this into account and restore our access. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hang on, let me raise my hand follow the process and uh, uh, um, 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 Mr. Mantel, I mean, I, I chair the Committee on Environmental Protection, uh, uh, you know, even though this is, uh, you know, Council Member Brandon's bill, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I'm a co-sponsor of this bill and my name on a bill when it comes to, you know, my committee 
normally means something. And so um, I hear what you have to say. I'm going to work with Councilman, uh, with, uh, you know, Councilman McBannon, who is, you know, the lead on this bill, but I'm the chair of the committee that it would have to go through. So, you know, you got Justin, you got me. So we, so we have some work to do here and I appreciate you coming here today to give us the benefit of your view, but you, you should know that I am a sponsor of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, <clears throat> next speaker is Ezra Schwartz, followed by Mark Schwartz. Starting time. Thank you, council members, for the opportunity to speak today regarding the bill to create a water bill database. I work for a firm representing homeowners, management companies, landlords, specifically with regards to the water bills. It should be noted that the bill in question to create a searchable water bill database is really just reinstating what was status quo in New York City until DP unilaterally, unilaterally shut down access in May 2020 without any public hearings. DP water bill access was previously consistent with all other public agencies in New York, including Department of Finance, Department of Buildings, HPD, and ACRIS. Uh, third parties were advised that all the information that was previously viewable via public access was now available via FOIL. We have our firm alone has filed 415 FOIL requests since DP shut down access and has received less than 25% back with numerous requests well over a year old. There are currently 1,525 total open requests with the DP. By contrast, there are only 161 open requests for Department of Finance, which has open access online. There are now one hour wait calls on the DP customer service with customers and customer representatives calling to obtain information that was previously accessible by the public. Taxpayer resources are now being wasted providing information to taxpayers that was previously readily available online. Information that was available within minutes can now take weeks, months, and years to obtain. In 2021, information flow when available should be instant. Instead in New York City, we're, we're going backwards 40 years. There's no logical reason that public water bills should not be viewable by the public. Transparency in government is the key to a well-run city. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I just wanna, I'll just repeat what I said to the, to the previous witness is that I agree with you. I'm a co-sponsor of this legislation. I'm gonna do what I can to get it done. Thank you very much it. for being here. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Next, our next speaker is Mark Schwartz, followed by, followed by Herschel Weiss. Starting time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, honorable council members and city agency officials for your hard work on behalf of all New Yorkers and hope everyone remains safe. I serve as a deputy mayor of my township in New Jersey and realize how hard these times are to govern. What we are hoping to be approved with this bill regarding the DEP water meter database is simply a continuation of 50 years of open access to the DEP billing system. This open access ended in May 2020 under your alleged guise of security as recently mentioned by the commissioner during his testimony. The claim that we can see homeowners' water bills and know when they are on vacation is preposterous. All info is in the past. If no water was used yesterday, that does not mean you aren't home from vacation today. Furthermore, has there ever been one known issue of any security happening as a result of water bills? DOF, DOB, and HBD all have open systems for decades. The New York Attorney General recently required a DOB to block access to owners email and phone numbers on only permits. That took an order from the AG, not a mid-level DEP manager to make a decision to shut off all access. The NYC Water Board held no hearings on this matter either. The commissioner made two specific comments. One, that this bill isn't following its best industry practices. Please note the governance of the city of New York is not an industry. It is a government and like all governments, it requires checks and balances that has been lacking in the last 18 months. Secondly, as to outside parties seeing water data and predatory lenders due to balances, as mentioned above, DOF, Department of Finance, has all tax data open to the public. They even began using a new system, 
DOF bills 18 times as much, $60 billion more in charges to the property owners. There has never been an accusation like this, let alone any criminal activity related to this privacy aspect. Trillions of dollars have billed over decades, no issue. DEP needs to end that song. DOB, can see, we can see everything about every building, every boiler, no issues. HPDs, what violations, what apartment called into violations. Accurish shows every deed, mortgage, and transfer doc, including your signatures. No acts, no problems, full access. Mr. Chair, you were intimately familiar with the old days of DEP, the errors, the media, the widows threatened with losing homes. Now with DEP denying all access, we can and should expect to return those day, to those days. Welcome back to city council. Please open up access to all, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am in favor of this bill, as you've heard, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is Herschel Weiss, followed by Linda Cohen. Starting time. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing, you, allowing me to present testimony today. My name is Herschel Weiss. I'm a mechanical engineer and a New York City master licensed plumber. A little background, for the past 20 years, I've been employed by Ashokan Water Services. Ashokan specializes in water conservation, water conservation, installation of water meters, backflow about. devices, meter reading, and backflow testing. Our clients include Columbia University, the Freedom Tower, Hudson Yards, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Related Management, Cushman Wakefield, JLL, Google, Left Rack, and guess who else? The DEP, and over 8,700 apartment buildings. In order to perform our work, we must understand what meters are registered with the DEP at the site and the associated meter reads. In the 1980s, Mayor Ed Koch agreed to provide this information to the public via a public access terminal each borough or a private computer hookup. The mayor's transparency was well ahead of his time. With this data, we could find the number of meters at each site, serial number, size, location, status. Under Mike Bloomberg, the information was expanded to include daily meter reads and copies of bills. Over the past year, under the, COVID of co uh, under the cover of COVID, the DEP has curtailed this information and provides a minimal of information and the poultry information that you get requires a customer password. As a result, when a taxpayer calls us to replace a meter or backflow, I must get their private password, which they usually don't know or don't wanna share, then research through piles of bills to get the proposal to remove a minor DEP violation. In most hours I spend, in most days I spend hours on the phone with the DEP representative who may not know what to look for. As a member of the city council, you receive many endless complaints from your constituents regarding DEP violations. We at Ashokan are hard at work to remove these violations, but we need the tools to make it happen. I urge you to mandate that the information be made available in an API format. Transparency is a prerequisite to good government. New York City was the first to make consumption data available. And an era of open data, New York City should lead the world, not hide its mistakes. Thank you. And one note, one aside, if Queens Legislations doesn't listen to Paul Mankiewicz and swim, they will never solve their street flooding issues without bankrupting the city. Um, you know, these guys are telling you what to do and you, if you want to ignore them, it's a totally separate issue, but you're never going to get there without spending trillions of dollars. Thank you for your time. Uh, uh, thank you, Herschel. Uh, you know, we, we, we know each other from the old days and it's good to see you again and to be reacquainted. And um, yes, I, 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 I you know, do support this bill. I'm gonna do what I can with Councilman Gladden to get it done. And thanks for the shout out to Paul Mankiewicz and like the Swim Coalition. Uh, I, I, we are gonna be hearing, uh, you know, testimony from them. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna go to the next witness and. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. It's good to see you again. Thank you for taking the time. You bet. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Cohen, followed by Gabriella Velarde Ward. Starting time. Hi, thank you, Chair Gennaro. 
these are two issues that relate to what Commissioner Sapienza and Director of Office of Resiliency, Janie Bavishi, and several, several council members have talked about today and how it relates to the Staten Island North Shore. Firstly, every year, approximately 500 million gallons of untreated sewage and polluted stormwater are discharged into the Kilman Cull. New high rise developments planned for the North Shore will add to this. The Port Richmond sewage treatment plant is old and for years activists have called for an upgrade. Yet during recent long-term control plans by DEP to reduce CSO in our waterways, DEP didn't re recommend any projects for the Kill Van Cull. As per an article in Curb Magazine, Keith Mahoney, the director of water quality planning at the DEP stated, quote, for the Kill Van Cull, we looked at probably a hundred different scenarios, but we couldn't find anything that worked there, close quote. So my question is, shouldn't it be mandatory to provide equity for all of our neglected waterways, including the often ignored North Shore of Staten Island? Here's the second issue, which is more urgent. Recently, I was told about the flooding that occurred on Amador Street and neighboring streets from Hurricane Ida. It had not been covered by the media. I went with a group of folks from Coalition for Wetlands and Forests to interview residents in this area. Many residents had thousands of dollars of flooding damage. Many are immigrants. The vast majority said that they never flooded before. It happened right after September 1st, right after 18 acres of mature forests were cut down and ponds where ducks swam were destroyed. Almost all this happened during this past summer. This destruction was to prepare for a BJ strip mall known as South Avenue Retail that was approved a few years ago during the ULEP process and given permits by DEC. Back then, climate change flooding did not seem to be such a high priority. There were many calls by concerned residents to stop the BJ's project and instead purchase this area and possibly make it into a blue belt, including in conversation with, in co conversation with some of the officials who, who are here today. Right before Hurricane Ida, Mayor de Blasio spoke with some of our residents, Staten Island residents, and said he wasn't sure what to do about our concerns. He asked DCP to meet with the community and get back to him. We don't know what the outcome of that is. After Hurricane Ida, some flooded re residents met with Assemblyman Cusick and told him of the flooding damage. He said he was alarmed. He and Senator Savino wrote to DCP asking that they halt the BJ's project until these issues can be resolved. However, DCP responded that they could not. If the BJ project continues, I have been told that the land will be raised and paved. Scientists that we know have predicted that this will cause the flooding to get worse. Can I just finish? DCP's own flood maps show that this area is at high risk. Many here have no <laughs> flood insurance and the cost of flood insurance may bankrupt many. I ask that the commissioners, um, the commissioner Sapienza consider a blue belt for this area. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. Uh, 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 thank you, Ms. Cohen. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, am, I, am I on? I, I'm not muted, okay. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Yeah, it, it, now you know, this is kind of a parochial, you know, issue, but you raise a larger point. I'm just wondering what organization you represent. I'm a member of Coalition for Wetlands and Forests. Okay, I just want to make sure I was, I was, I, I was, I was, you know, clear on that. And and your uh, uh, the council member is Debbie Rose, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, uh, you, know, you know, regarding like the. Citywide thing. I mean, uh, that's really more, you know, you know, uh, 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 my area. Like, like with regard to this development, this BJ's, whether it goes forward or it doesn't go forward. You know, you've got the mayor, your local representative. They're all, you know, kind of, you know, in the mix. And so, um, you know, in terms of me as a legislator, as chair of the committee on environmental protection, uh, uh, on the chair of the committee on environmental protection, I kind of operate on on sort of like a different like citywide level. Um, but, you know, this is, I think, very important. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be seeing, uh, you know, Debbie Rose tomorrow. I don't know if she's still, uh, you know, on the uh, uh, um, on the hearing now, but uh, I will make sure to voice, um, you know, your concerns to her because where we have a state meeting tomorrow, I'm going to be seeing her. And so, um, you know, this is kind of her her area and uh, um 
and I, I, I'm limited in what I'm able to do, but I'm, I, I will bring this up with Debbie tomorrow because we do a lot of business together, Debbie and I. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gabriella Velarde Ward, who's followed by our last reg registered speaker, Amy Motsny. Starting time. Well, thank you everyone for allowing me to testify. I'm gonna repeat a lot of things that Linda had said previously. I am uh, Gabriella Velarde Ward and I am the co coordinator of the Coalition for Wetlands and Forests. And we've been involved in trying to stop the, the destruction of the wetland for at least four years now. Um, Graniteville, where the wetland is, is on the northwest coast of Staten Island. We are surrounded by water. I had been saying for the last four years that if we lose the wetland, we will be flooded. And I was not using scare tactics. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I'm an architect and a, and a construction supervisor, and I uh, represented the park department for the mayor's office construction for sustainable construction. We were formulating oh. policy for the city for sustainable construction. That was in the 1990s. Um, The, the, uh, so as I said, we, we fought this for four years. On uh, July 4th, the, the trees started to come down. We're still in court, by the way. The trees started to come down on July 4th. By August 31st, 80% of the trees were gone and the soil was compacted. It no longer absorbs any water. Uh, on September 1st, we were flooded in many areas in Graniteville. Well, this is the first time we've ever been flooded. Many areas in Graniteville and Amador was tremendously flooded. The two separate people, two people at separate times told me that somebody died there. Um, the person on the corner of South and Amador is looking at a cost to repair his house of $55,000. Somebody lost a car, somebody lost a small business, all so of his supplies were in the house. Tremendous, tremendous damage there. And we had never been flooded before. Most people in Graniteville do not have flood insurance, as I don't either, because we had never been flooded before, as I said. There are... Uh, As I said, all right, since we've had this and we've never had it before, wh who's gonna protect us now? This was a lethal wound to us because we, we're not safe in our homes anymore. Once this is down, because of climate change, torrential rain flooding, sea level rise, and I said, we're, we're surrounded by water. It's a lethal wound because we are going to be flooded. This is only the beginning. This is the first and the least horrible flooding that we had, it's only gonna get worse and worse as we continue. Um, and, and, and as Linda said, uh, it, one of the solutions may be to make this a blue belt. And I know it's private property, but when it comes to loss of life, uh, lo life has to trump private property. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up is since I'm an architect, um, I know that, the, I work for parks, pro, uh, public sector. The, the private sector has to be has to conform to the requirements of the public sector or with climate change, we're just, we're just spinning our wheels. We're all, everything the, the public sector does is undone by the private sector. So we've got to look at that. And, and my last question is who's going to protect I'm us? I'm expired. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Ward, um, now, uh, uh, you know, my question is that you know, if this is a true wetland, how did DEC sign off on a permit to let a private developer building a wetlands, like how'd that happen? Because we had, we didn't have a public hearing. They were, we had 1700 letters sent to DEC requesting a public hearing, 1700 letters requesting a public hearing, but they said it's not warranted. We could, we lost the opportunity to have expert testimony there and the and DEC told us it was not warranted. And we're still uh, in court, we're still in court. Okay, but you know, uh, you know, again, you know, you know, not to you know, litigate this here, but uh, you know, DEC, as, as, as a former deputy commissioner for DEC, um, uh, you know what, I am, here's what I'm going to do. I, I, there's a notation on my screen that, uh, you know, Council Member Rose wishes to speak. I'm going to turn this over to Council Member Rose. This is kind of a parochial issue. This is her district. I will defer to this. There's a limit to how much I'm going to let this go back and forth because this is a you know not the not like the stated I mean yes the stated purpose of this hearing is to talk about flooding and all that so yes it is you know germane but it does have a very parochial component 
So I will uh, I will defer to Councilmember Rose, who can briefly have colloquy with you, but then I'm going to have to move on, and you're going to have to take it up with Councilmember Rose. Will I have the opportunity after. to respond? I, I again, I you know you 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 have used your time. I'm recognizing Councilmember Rose, and you are not recognized. So I recognize Councilmember Rose. Starting um, sure. time. Chair, thank you. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, engage in, in the conversation or back and forth. What I wanted to say was that I will be more than willing to have a conversation with you um, at your convenience about this specific project and, and the flooding issues. Um, yeah, I just wanted you to know that uh, I'm willing to have that conversation with you. Um, uh, and we're, we're working on um, Ms. Ward's concerns. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Council Member Rose. I, I, you know, you're a great uh, uh, um, council member, and I, I, I'm sure you will do your best to, um, you know, make a positive impact. Uh, you know, in this situation, which I don't know a lot about, and you do. So, um, uh, with that said, uh, you know, Mr. Moderator, like we're going to move forward with other witnesses. Thank you, Council Member Rose. Thank you, Chair. Our next speaker is our last registered speaker for the hearing, Amy Motsny. Uh, she will be given six minutes to speak as she is presenting testimony for herself and another person who had to drop out of the hearing due to an emergency. And, and uh, I, I would just say that uh, uh, before we start the clock on this last witness, I want to, you know, uh, uh, you know, thank this witness for being willing to go last in order to pre in order to present. Uh, 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 testimony for, you know, two different entities and being that she, you know, had the patience to do that, I'm willing to give her some, uh, 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 I'm willing to give her, you know, latitude beyond six minutes because I believe she has earned it. So um, with that said, I, uh, you know, recognize the last witness. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Gennaro, um, and thank you, uh, Chairpersons and members of the New York City Council, agency staff present here today for your comments and leadership in convening this hearing. My name is Amy Motsny, and I'm going to be giving back-to-back -back testimony, first on behalf of uh, SWIM Coalition, and then right after that on behalf of Gowanus Canal Conservancy, where I'm the watershed senior planner. Um, so uh, SWIM Coalition is a group of 70-plus organizations dedicated to ensuring swimmable and fishable waters around New York City through sustainable stormwater management practices, both green and gray infrastructure. Um, SWIM member organizations endorse a truly sustainable view of watershed management, one that restores ecological systems, creates local economic opportunities, and equitably distributes the benefits of green infrastructure. Since our founding in 07, SWIM members across every borough have closely monitored and provided public input for the C city's 11 CSO LTCPs, the NYC Green Infrastructure Plan, and the Stormwater Management P Plan for the city's MS4 system, as well as many of the policies that have informed these programs. SWIM wishes to acknowledge the ongoing efforts of the NYC DEP staff to adapt to the myriad of challenges and conditions they face to address the negative impacts on our infrastructure from stormwater runoff. DEP has made a commendable effort to sustain an ongoing dialogue with stakeholders as they've implemented the phases of the city's long-term plans, and we hope to continue this engagement into the future. Members of the SWIM Coalition Steering Committee provided input put for intro 1618 when it was originally introduced in 2019. We strongly support intro 1618 in its entirety. Passage of this legislation would allow the much needed studies, annual reports and watershed plans to be shared with the public, both to inform them of the status of efforts underway and to provide them with an opportunity to give input to the city officials regarding the real time conditions on the ground in their communities and on the waterways they steward and use for recreation, cultural and educational activities. SWIM also supports intro 2425, which would require a DEP commissioner for each borough. We wish to note that the appointed commissioners recommended in this bill should participate in the review and delivery of reports, plans, studies, and public meetings that are required by the legislation in intro 1618. We recommend that the borough commissioners hold quarterly public meetings to update stakeholders on the status of the various projects underway in their borough. This is important because to date, DEP has only held public updates on all of the LTCPs one time per year. The lack of more frequent updates to stakeholders has left has left the public in the dark as to what these programs will accomplish. Quarterly meetings would aid in developing a deeper understanding of the solutions the city is actively implementing. Um, finally, we also offer our support for the testimony delivered today by SWIM Coalition member Riverkeeper. And I just wanna note that, you know, in light of the recent storm events, that provided a stark reminder of just how vulnerable our citizens and vital infrastructure are in the face of such storms. 
the devastating loss of life and the impacts of the city sewer system backing into people's homes, flooding on our streets, surrounding highways and transportation, transportation hubs were alarming to say the least. We must build the city's long-term control, stormwater management, and green infrastructure plans, all slated to be completed by 2042 based on future projections for our region. These plans are not currently based on future rainfall and sea level rise projections, and that must be immediately changed. To this point, we further offer our support um, of the recommendations presented in two recent reports, the NYC Stormwater Resiliency Plan and the Mayor's Extreme Weather Report, which provides a blueprint for a series of media adaptations and accelerated timelines for many of the plans the city has already underway. We monitor next steps of their implementation and advise city council to ensure the public has an opportunity to weigh in on the recommended actions proposed in every public across the end of the year. Um, SWIM will also be submitting written testimony, um, so look forward to that. We thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to switch my Gwanis Canal Conservancy hat on. <laughs> um, so Guanas Canal Conservancy is the environmental steward for the Guanas Canal and watershed. Uh, since 2006, we've led grassroots volunteer projects, educated students on environmental issues, and worked with agencies, elected officials, and the community to advocate for, build, and maintain innovative green infrastructure around the canal. We appreciate the efforts of this committee to advance climate forward planning, reporting, and accelerated investment in infrastructure to address persistent challenges associated with the city's aging sewer system. Honest neighborhood is on the brink of major change associated with the federal Superfund cleanup and the pending neighborhood rezoning, which is currently in the final stages of the ULERT process. As part of these ongoing processes, GCC has consistently advocated for infrastructure investment to improve water quality as a result of combined sewer overflows to the canal and inland flooding as a result of limited sewer system capacity. Most re recently, GCC and our partners in the Guanas Neighborhood Coalition for Justice have demanded a net zero CSO rezoning to ensure future development in the neighborhood does not contribute additional CSO to the canal. As part of this demand, we repeatedly requested the city provide accurate and up-to-date modeling of the sewer system that utilizes best available data to realistically account for the reasonable worst case development scenario and increased precipitation as a result of climate change. The existing long-term control plan for Gowanus was completed in 2012 and fails to account for future development at the scale of the proposed neighborhood plan and relies on outdated precipitation data for future infrastructure planning. We are concerned that without a clear process for assessing, tracking, and reporting on these planning efforts, the Gowanus neighborhood will be left unequipped to withstand future impacts of development and climate change. Related to these requests and in line with our partners at SWIM, we strongly support 1618 in its entirety. Um, this will be a critical step uh, for assessing the impacts of the unified stormwater rule, um, ensuring that new progressive policy um, is tracked and, and successful as we see new development in the watershed. Um, we will also be following up with extensive written comments and we really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sure, okay, Thanks. yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I wanna weigh in here, Mr. Moderator. Um, and uh, if I just may interrupt chairs, uh, um, you may go ahead and adjourn the hearing after any comments from you and the other. Sure, you. sure. Um, uh, I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, um, Indy Matsni for having the patience <clears throat> to, you know, uh, um, um, stay around, uh, you know, until the end of the hearing and also, uh, you know, present testimony on behalf of the Gowanus Canal. Uh, 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 the uh, um, Canal Conservancy. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I look forward to working with the uh, Swim Coalition. Uh, I would urge you to um, uh, reach out to my um, legislative director, uh, you know, Navi Power. I don't know if you know who she is, but I know that Navi is listening. And uh, so, you know, Navi will find you uh, so that we can um, connect on these issues. <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and also just to you know bring the light that it was you know years and years ago that I passed the uh, um, uh, you know New York City you know, comprehensive stormwater management plan you know back then it was really more you know focused on what we could do to manage stormwater so that we you know wouldn't have like the CSO problem that we have and that's what has resulted in like the rain gardens and the bioswales and you know, all the stuff that was part of that good effort. And, and now, you know, as we move forward and we see flooding, you know, so now, like, you know, back at that time, like, the, the, the you know, the massive amount of stormwater was creating like a huge CSO problem. Now we have like an inland flooding problem. 
And so but certainly we want to work closely with the swim coalition uh, as we move these bills forward and as we you know march down the field with other issues that we have to take. And I uh, you know give you special credit for you know waiting until the end to um, uh, you know make sure that your good views were heard and those of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. And uh, with that, I thank you. I thank all the witnesses. I thank the moderator. I thank my co-chairs. Um, and I thank all the witnesses, uh, can, and, and all the members who, who took part of the hearing. Uh, and uh, uh, if my fellow co-chairs do not wish to be heard, uh, Mr. Moderator, you asked them if they wish to add a um, um, uh, um, uh, so uh, it, 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 it seems that they have no, uh, uh, you know, closing remarks uh, to, to, to make. I wish to uh, thank them for, you know, co-chairing this hearing with me. And, uh, you know, with that, uh, I, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, good hearing is adjourned. I'll use my actual gavel to do that. Here we go. You didn't think I had my own gavel, Mr. Moderator, did you? But I do have it. So with that said.